Yeah, good session yesterday, Ed, with uh, Bobby Mariano. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, that was nice, yeah. And my former professors. Uh, Looks good, actually. Lansigan I told, I told, he's a friend of mine. I mean, we, we see each other in Pennsylvania. So yeah, I used to drive around yeah. with him. Yeah. Uh, it looks good. You know, I think we used, we used his book when I was an undergraduate student. I've never met it. Uh, <laughs> that was nice. Uh, yeah, I met him at the ambassador's residence in DC when the Joey Quisha was the ambassador. We were both hosted by Tito Joey because Tito Excuse Joey is more Ladies and gentlemen, you know, we are in supposed to be in the waiting room, but um, looks like uh, people are coming in already. So maybe, um, uh, well, <laughs> we'll sit up my Yeah. You know, um, get to our conversations later. Yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Are we really supposed to be silent in the waiting room? <laughs> uh, you know, we're gonna start in a minute, but um, generally, we yeah, uh, board members, yes, but um, I think uh, we were not able to uh, keep uh, other participants in the waiting room. So we're going to start anyway. Thank you. You need it. We have five more minutes. <clears throat> <clears throat> Well, we are to start the um, video. Okay. Post on the video. Seven fifty-five. We should be starting this. Now.
science and technology and innovation these are indispensable in the modern economy, in the modern world. At the MSI, and uh, we resolved among Science about sixty of us, local members, first to form our principal so in that the we continue to the host our meetings here, but also to go and uh, we resolved to among about sixty of us uh, try to get space first to form our principal in the mother. So, Paase, historically, uh, in the past uh, 10, 20 years, for sure, uh, have been collaborating with uh, our counterparts here in the Philippines at various universities. So, Paase, historically, uh, in the past uh, 10, years, for sure, uh, have been collaborating Hello, everyone. Hello, Joel. Giselle, can we start now? Oh, you're on mute. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to the special plenary session of the 40th uh, past anniversary and 2020 annual scientific uh, meeting and symposium. Today is very special because we have uh, guest lecturers and we have the conferment of awards. So I would like to um, give the floor to our host for today. Dr. Joel Coelho, former PASA president and professor at the University of Arizona. Joel, I would uh, thank like you so to much, uh, Giselle. Thank you. Uh, um, good morning, everyone uh, in the Philippines and here in North America. Good afternoon or good evening. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed for joining all of us. This is a special like plenary, uh, Giselle. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone uh, in the Philippines and here in North America. Good afternoon or good evening. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed for joining all of us. This is a special plenary. Giselle, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone uh, in the Philippines and here in North America. Good afternoon or good evening. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed for joining all of us. This is a special plenary. Giselle, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone uh, in the Philippines and here in North America. Good afternoon or good evening. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed for joining all of us. This is a special plenary. Giselle, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone uh, in the Philippines and here in North America. Good afternoon or good evening. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. <laughs> All right, can, can everyone hear me? <laughs> All right, let's, let's start with some uh, housekeeping rules. Uh, I'd like to request everyone please to uh, mute your microphone. Uh, we don't want any extraneous uh, or background noise interfering with our proceedings. So we appreciate your cooperation on this matter. Thank you. Uh, and, and second housekeeping point is uh, we encourage you of course to uh, post your questions or comments or remarks as we go through the presentations by our distinguished uh, speakers. I do not think that we will have time to uh, address those questions, but uh, we will be collecting all of your questions or comments. We'll be passing them on to our speakers and we will request them to provide written questions, which we will then subsequently share with everyone. So thank you very much. Um, so again, to formally open this uh, special plenary session, uh, our president, uh, Dr. Giselle Concepcion, and I uh, would like to welcome all of you very cordially uh, to this uh, plenary session, which is part of the uh, celebration for the 40th anniversary of the Philippine American Academy of Science and Engineering, or PASE. 
So welcome everyone. Um, to uh, start the session, so we have two parts. The first part, which will last uh, a little under two hours, would be uh, the guest lectures of our distinguished guests and invited guests. And then the next uh, part, which is about half an hour, would be an awarding of uh, distinctive awards to some exceptional individuals that uh, we are honoring today and as part of the 40th anniversary of Baha'i. So without further ado, we are starting the, uh, the lecture series. Um, I know that there, there is a title for these lectures, but looking at the presentations we're gonna have, I actually just realized that they represent certain elements or features of what we refer to as the fourth industrial revolution, which really is the convergence of the physical, the digital, and the biological. And this convergence is really made possible by emergent technologies that we're all enjoying now worldwide, uh, such as uh, data and inf information systems, uh, video algorithms, data analytics, artificial intelligence, robotics, automation, and so on and so forth. And today we will see all of these elements or some of these elements applied to various sectors, including in entertainment, including in uh, public health and uh, public administration, including in indoor uh, agriculture, controlled environment systems, as well as in education, uh, in terms of, uh, particularly in terms of delivery and pedagogy. So we have a, a whole range of really exciting and interesting presentations uh, this morning in the Philippines, this evening in the United States. So without further ado, we're gonna start with our first uh, distinguished uh, speaker who is Dr. Ann Aaron, uh, who is currently the Director of Encoding Technologies at Netflix, uh, which is in the Bay Area in Silicon Valley in the United States. Um, Mon, I was wondering whether you could uh, pull the uh, introductory slide for Dr. Aaron. All right, so just to, uh, uh, explicitly say this, uh, the CVs, curriculum vita of every one of our uh, guest speakers today, as well as the awardees, are very voluminous because they're very well accomplished. So I'm not going to have the time to uh, really highlight all of their accomplishments. So what I did was just I picked uh, three or four of their notable accomplishments to share with you uh, just by way of a short introduction. So again, Dr. Aaron is the Netflix Director of Encoding Technologies. She's got eight uh, technology patents with the uh, United States uh, Patent Office. Uh, four have been awarded and four are uh, pending. Uh, she obtained her PhD as well as her Master's of Science in Electrical Engineering from Stanford. And she obtained two bachelor's degrees, one in computer engineering, the other one in physics at Ateneo de Manila University. So we're excited to have you and very much welcome Anne uh, to uh, Paase, and I yield the floor to you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Coelho. Let me share my screen. Okay, can you all see it? Yes. yes. Thank you. Um, good morning. Uh, Good afternoon, uh, good evening to all of you, wherever you may be. Um, maganda umaga, magandang hapon, magandang gabi po sa inyong lahat. I'm Ann Aaron. I'm speaking from California. And more specifically, I'm in my home office here in Menlo Park in Silicon Valley, surrounded with my plants, if you can see it, um, to keep my spirit up these days. Uh, from social media, I heard that the term there is a uh, Plantita, so I'm a newly minted Plantita. Um, I'm grateful for participating in this 40th anniversary of the Philippine Amer American Academy of Science and Engineering, but I'm also a bit sad because I should have been there in Manila giving this talk today. Um, yeah, so I, I, last weekend was my dad's 70th birthday and so my siblings and I and the grandkids we were all supposed to be in Manila to sell to celebrate the 70th birthday of Lolo um, sorry and so 
I think so. I'll start with a shout out to my dad, who's probably watching right now, and it's it's relevant because my dad started as a chemical engineer, and he gracefully transitioned into marketing and sales and a CEO, and then eventually went back to agriculture and farming there in the in in Laguna, um, and it's a farming and agriculture, as many of you know, is a very crucial sector of science for the Philippines. And I believe my own interest in science and math, I owe it to him and to my mom, who was also a math major in college. So before I go to the tech part, I will allow me to share a bit more about myself since I'm probably not as well known or famous as the next speaker. Um, so I, grew, I was born and I grew up in Manila and my interest in math and science led me to Agham Road or Philippine Science or PSAI for short. Then after that, I did, as mentioned, I did my uh, bachelor's degrees in physics and computer engineering in, at Ateneo de Manila University. At that time, actually, Father Ben Nebres was our president, so I know he's going to be recognized today. So hello, Father Ben. After Ateneo, I was hungry to learn more, and I was curious to see the world. So I applied to all the good engineering programs I could find out there and um, ended up Fortunately, at Stanford, okay, my son is here saying hello, but say hello. Um, so my kids Hi. might come in. Hi. Um, I, I um, fortunately, I ended up at Stanford University. Um, and this is my, me and my mom almost 20 years ago. Um, she, my first day at Stanford, and I, you can see how excited I was uh, to be there. At Stanford, I did my PhD in electrical engineering, master's and PhD in electrical engineering, with my PhD research focused on video compression. And yes, people do study, do PhDs in video compression. After that, I went to various Silicon Valley companies, um, startups mostly. Some of them did do well, some of them didn't, really, really did do well. And in 2011, I got laid off from my job. I had a baby who's now, um, he's here actually watching, who's now nine years old. And I ended up interviewing for Netflix. Um, this is my interview schedule then. Uh, and when I interviewed, I was not the typical, I didn't look like the typical tech bro, but luckily I you know, got the job. And at Netflix was a good environment for me to thrive. Um, from there, I was a software engineer that eventually led teams at Netflix. As this article says, one of my main roles at Netflix is to make sure that Netflix doesn't buffer by making the files as small as possible. And here is a claim to fame. I was dubbed the stream queen. Here's my crown. Uh, this article was shared like 50,000 times. It's an article in the Philippines, but I'm sure those half of that were my classmates who some of them are watching and my cousins too. But yeah, so that's my stream queen. Uh, so today, now going to the serious part, um, today I am director of encoding technologies at Netflix. And hopefully you've all heard about Netflix. Um, hopefully you all watch Netflix. And in these days where we're all staying home and trying to stay home to be safe, I hope you find some comfort and you know, some escape when you watch your Netflix shows. Uh, the team I lead is responsible for all the media that you see on, on the Netflix site. So the images, the video, the audio, uh, the captions or subtitles when you're watching a show. And now that we are also producing our own movies and shows, we are also using these encoding technologies to improve the production process in making these shows and TVs and, and movies. So here are my few of my favorite Netflix shows. And I was asking if there's a chat. So if you have favorite Netflix shows, please add it to the chat and share it with me. Um, so that's The Crown, um, Bojack Horseman, which is both dark and funny, one day at a time, and Bodyguard, which is because um, the guy is, you know, very active and guapo. And of course, Crash Lighting on You <laughs> it deserves three photos, uh, my one and only K-drama that I've watched. So now let's go. How do we actually deliver these shows and movies to all of you? So I'm going to describe some of the building blocks of the Netflix streaming system and with a bit more focus on the work that I've actually done on the encoding side. So first we start, start with a production uh, or filming of the show and movie. 
which, which produces the final video and audio master of the show. And then it goes to encoding where the system generates multiple versions of the files so that we can send it to all the devices and that people use to watch Netflix. And it can handle all the different network conditions. And then the files are sent all over the internet to deploy it, to store it. Um, and our goal is to make these files as close to, as possible to our members. Lastly, we have the streaming engine, uh, the running on TVs, laptops, phones. And once you hit play, it requests the files that are best suited to your device and from the closest storage possible. And um, my team is responsible for this part of the system, the encoding side. And the, our goal is to get you high quality watching experience while sending the least amount of data that we can. And so why is this a difficult problem? Well, if we don't do our, our job correctly, while you're watching a show, you would see this, and that's like a rebuffer, and you know, you're gonna be annoyed. Or you would see this, uh, this is Eleven, you'll see her all pixelated, and for those who watch Stranger Things, you can't recognize her, and she almost looks like the monster, the Demogorgon. So we don't want this to happen. And so why is this, yeah, th this is what we do if we don't do our jobs correctly, but also why is this a difficult problem? It's because video itself is big data. So let's take an episode of Crash Landing. And um, this, I actually looked this up. This is episode five. Um, one, this episode is 60 minutes long and a video is composed of multiple pictures. For this specific episode, this is about 115,000 pictures. And if you convert that to data, that is 206 gigabytes. Now, if you did make the file smaller, this would require 300 megabits per second of data. I don't think anyone here has that good internet connection. And even if you do, you have to share it with everyone in your house who are also probably on Zoom calls. So for us to be able to send this seamlessly throughout the world, we have to make the file smaller. And since Netflix is all over the world, some people may not have good bandwidth. Uh, some people may be watching on their phones or accessing the internet primarily using their cell phone connection, which is also may, may be unreliable. And even in some places, for some members, they have strict data constraints, right? You may only have a prepaid plan where you have one gigabyte or four gigabyte. And we want you to be able to watch as many shows as you want and not use up all your data. So, so our goal is to be able to deliver these episodes seamlessly to all our members and reduce the data by 10 times, 100 times, even 1,000 times without hurting the picture quality. So how do we do this? Um, this is where our work comes in. So before 2015, we were encoding our shows and movies all in the same way. It didn't matter whether it was a cartoon animation or something a bit more drama, like Orange is the New Black or something with action. We were sending standard definition video at 1,000 kilobits per second. But part of my work, part of like PhD I did was thinking that, look, these different content actually can, one has more smooth, smooth pictures and not a lot of movement. Some of them has more texture. So in the case of animation, you can actually send less data with this, with, while delivering the same quality and with a high action, then you need more data. So in 2015, one of my first research on algorithm work was to do per title encoding where we were analyzing each show and each movie. And depending on the picture characteristics, the signal characteristics, we can optimize our encoding recipe for that piece of data. So something like Bojack Horseman, which is more smooth, uh, no motion, you can send standard definition at 640 kilobits per second, but something that has more action would need closer to 900 or 1000 kilobits per second. Now you're all familiar with watching movies or shows probably, and you can tell me like, but some scenes are, have more action, some scenes are smoother. So that's true, you know, you can have a Stranger Things where you have action, you can have like this more slower, slower content and you have some that are darker. So what we did, 
even more was that instead of just analyzing each piece of episode or each movie, we were analyzing every single shot of the movie and, and adapting or optimizing or encoding recipes for each shot of movie. And the, with this lower level optimization, the, the bit rate that you saw earlier that ranged from 600 kilobits per second to 1000 kilobits per second, we can now bring down to as low as 250 kilobits per second. So with some of the recent innovation we have, we can send standard definition um, content to you at this bit rate. Now you can ask me, how do you know that you're lowering, your, lowering the data and you're actually not hurting picture quality? You're not making the video look pixelated like that. Um, no, we cannot watch every single piece of movie that we encode and every single output that we encode. So this is something that we actually have to optimate, automate and check what the quality is. So that is another piece of research and some of the patents that um, Dr. Coelho was talking about. Some, this is some of the research we, that we've done is how do we measure video quality without actually having people look at the video? And we did this by uh, developing a metric by first getting ground truth, ground truth data where we had people look at scenes of a movie and rate the picture quality. And then we looked at the, the science of the human visual system to get features and combining this ground truth data of people rating movies, the picture quality. So not like, you know, one star, two star for the actual content, but just the picture quality, combining the human visual science with the ground truth data, combining it in a machine learning model, we have a metric that can predict the picture quality of our shows and movies. And that is how we can bring down the bit rates to these numbers and knowing that we're actually not hurting quality. But what does, you know, there's the science and research behind it, but what does this actually mean for our members? So before 2015, if you had six gigabytes of data, um, you could only watch about six hours of Netflix. Um, in 2015, when we were optimizing per title, this brought us up to about 10 hours of Netflix for four gigabytes of data. And now we, with uh, the per shot optimization, you can watch 23 hours of Netflix. More importantly, that means that with four gigabytes of data, you can watch all episodes of Crash Landing on You because if it was in 2015, you would only watch 10 hours. And you know, that's medyo biten, diba? Uh, one way to think about our team at Netflix is that we want to, like Marie Kondo, we want to tidy up the bits that we send out there to reduce congestion on the internet. So every bit that we, sound, we send out there on the internet should help spark joy that, the, you know, that our shows bring. Cheesy. Uh, so I will go now to the second part of our system where um, we just briefly talk about the deployment so as I said, we want to store our shows as close to our members as possible. So this is a picture of the Netflix content delivery network, which we call Open Connect. So all these dots here are servers where we store, uh, store our shows and movies. Um, here it's about, it says 12,000. This is about a year ago. So I'm sure it's much more than this today. And, and what we do is that, so we, what we want is that it's as close to our members as possible so that we have less rebuffers and lower delays in sending the data. And we do that by, by, by um, sending and storing this to those servers or caches during off peak hours, which means that when you're sleeping and when you're not watching Netflix. So for example, we would have new episodes of Stranger Things and when you're sleeping, we would send it the new episodes to servers in Japan and, you know, bunch, we have a bunch of servers in the Philippines. And then when you wake up or in the middle of the day, in the evening, when you want to watch, then you can watch these shows and movies directly from the caches or the servers that are in your region. And that reduces the need to transfer the data across the trans you know, trans-Pacific fiber from the US to the shows. And so we can reduce the congestion across these, this, this, uh, this pipe. And ultimately what that means is just lower delay and less rebuffers to our members. Now let's move to the last part of our system, which is the adaptive streaming engine. Uh, 
So as you're probably all aware, now that we're all used to doing video conference calls, uh, our, the networks in our houses or anywhere is quite unreliable, right? You fluctuating, sometimes you get cut off. So this is an example of a th throughput in your, in your network, in your network condition. And it's stable, goes down, and it goes up. So how do we handle this when you're watching Netflix? Well, we do that by actually producing various quality levels of our shows and movies. So each there, the, the y-axis is quality and all those different colors are different quality levels, which also re respond to different bit rates. And our, so what happens is that when, you're, when you click play, we have an adaptive streaming engine that looks at what the throughput is, estimates that, and then requests the, the quality that is suited for your network. So in this case, you would see that you're playing in blue and then you go to green and then you go up to blue again. And hopefully when it goes down here, um, we, we, it prevents you from rebuffering or stalling and you would just see slightly lower quality. And hopefully this lower quality doesn't last too long and it doesn't distract you from whatever exciting part of the show you're watching. So all this together, encoding, deployment, adaptive streaming, those are the types of technologies that we build. And, but ultimately what this means is that with this, they can all watch better picture quality with less rebuffers, whether that's my kids. So that's my kids watching Netflix here in California or my mom watching Netflix on her iPad in Manila or my, um, my nieces and nephews fighting over what cartoon to watch, also in Manila, or my sister in New Zealand watch, enjoying her rest time in New, Ze in New Zealand. So that's the technology I helped build at Netflix. Um, I know this, this conference, there's a lot of talk about you know, um, health, uh, about COVID um, and agriculture. And to, to be honest, sometimes when I look at what's happening around the world today, the pandemic, social injustice, and equity, the environment. Sometimes this type of work feels smaller or insignificant. But then I also tell myself that, you know, stories, sharing stories is actually important. And I, I think stories, sharing stories um, to the world is important because hopefully they can help change minds and maybe even actions too. So in my case, you know, hopefully, for personally, it did change my views about mass incarceration. A, a documentary like 13th helped change my mind on uh, mass incarceration and the history of racial injustice in the U.S. On It could change people's mind on immigration or homophobia for a show like One Day at a Time. Or on caring more about the environment, like um, when you watch those beautiful scenes in our planet. And stories are also important, also simply because they help us connect and comfort us. You know, I love how my sister can bring a bit of the Philippines to New Zealand as she watches her favorite Kathniel movies, like she's dating a gangster or um, I don't know what else, can't help falling her love. Um, you know, she can share a bit of the Philippines to her kids there. And I also love how I can bond with my family and friends from afar when we talk about K-drama. And during these times when the world feels a bit more stressful, I like how I can just stop thinking and turn on a you know, silly reality show like Indian um, Brides or Indian um, Wedding or Tiger King. So I think stories are important and we build this technology for the ultimate goal that we can help share stories for connection, comfort, and hopefully even change. With that, I would like to end um, with this. You know, in my day-to-day -day job, aside from interacting with my colleagues at Netflix, I do work um, with other companies in Silicon Valley and a lot of tech companies around the world. Sadly, I don't encounter a lot of people like me, you know, Filipino, uh, uh, brown women, and I always question it. And I question it because I know that, you know, we Filipinos are as smart and as creative as the people I meet. And we are as smart as creative that we could build technology and innovate. 
And I know that we are resor as resourceful and has, as hardworking enough to overcome challenges. And I know we are as empathetic and even more empathetic sometimes to become great leaders of these companies and work towards greater good. So why are they less of us in tech, in Silicon Valley and in tech in general? And I think the answer is simple and it's because there's, it's not a level playing field. You know, there are a lot of societal structures and a lot of societal injustices, both in our own communities in the Philippines, but also in the rest of the world, which deprive hard working Filipinos of these opportunities. And I will not get into that topic because that's a long topic and this is a tech, tech symposium. But all I, all I wanna say is that us who have been blessed with privilege, let us find ways to change these social injustices and these social um, structures, whether that's through government, like um, the next speaker is gonna speak about, or healthcare, or farming, or education, or even simply uh, with sharing stories around the world. With that, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Aaron. Uh, we applaud you for such a, uh, an excellent presentation. Uh, if you're just joining us, Dr. Ann Aaron just uh, completed or finished her presentation. So welcome to uh, this plenary lecture. I'd like to encourage everyone as well to uh, post your questions, which we won't have time to provide answers for, but I promise that I will uh, get the written answers from Dr. Aaron and share them uh, with uh, you. But as a host, I have the uh, prerogative of asking a couple of questions to, to Ann. So Ann, um, First of all, a comment uh, in regard to your comment about the importance of storytelling. Uh, storytelling really is, uh, it, it's, it's hard linked. It's, it's in our brain as human beings. Uh, we all do storytelling. And for scientists and engineers, certainly we need to be better and more articulate uh, when it comes to our storytelling so that we could really convey to young people and to everyone uh, the, the significance and the importance and the impact of what we are doing in the science and engineering community. And I'm sure, Anne, you, you relate to that because you are part of the science and engineering community as well. But uh, two quick questions. The first one is, what do you see in the horizon or what do you wanna see in the horizon in terms of innovations or technologies that could further revolutionize uh, the, the tasks that you're doing in terms of encoding and all the way to streaming? Yeah, I, I, think, I think it doesn't stop there, right? Um, I, I talked about 250 kilobits per second, but that's standard definition TV. I think all around the world, the need for entertainment is still gonna increase. You know, people right. want 4K, want HDR. So I think just be enabling that. I mean, we're not done yet with that. Right. And, and this is a combination of, you know, we have faster machines. Um, we have content, we, we're advancing our, what we know about signal processing. And so I think that's right. um, all that can help. There's of course Correct. machine Correct. learning. All right, yeah. So just so you know, uh, Netflix uh, last year had a revenue of about 20 billion US dollars. So it really is a growing company and it's not stopping there, I'm sure. I'm sure the revenue for 2020, particularly in the midst of the pandemic is going to be much greater than that in 2019. Uh, last question, please, is uh, in terms of the uh, processes that you're doing, again, from encoding all the way to streaming, how do you ensure the security of your, your data, of, of your movies, uh, so that they don't get hacked? Yeah, I mean, uh, that, that is, uh, so we're, we're very uh, careful about security, whether that's the privacy of our members. And that's a good thing about being a subscription service, right? We don't have to, we don't rely on ads. So we really, we take care of the privacy, the personal information of our members. And security being a premium entertainment company, we are contract, contractually obligated to keep the security. So we have DRM. You know, all, all our content is DRM, and sometimes um, that's sometimes one of the blocks that we have for deployment. You know, we have some devices out there that are not secure, the uh, DRM, so we, we, can't, um, we can't deliver to that. And so, so that combination of DRM, encrypting our files on the servers, um, having not people not having access, especially to preview content. So that's, that's when 
you've released the show into the wild, you know, anyone can do, do a screen grab, you know, of low quality, but, but when that show hasn't been released, we're very, very careful about who can access those, those shows. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Aaron, and I hope that you will stay on for uh, our uh, next uh, lecturers, as well as for the awarding ceremony, of course. Yes. We give I'll you our here. virtual thunderous applause. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so moving on, we're going to move to our uh, second uh, distinguished uh, lecturer. I'd like to request, uh, Juan, if you could please display the uh, introductory slide for uh, Dr. Richard Gomez. Uh, Dr. Gomez, of course, is the uh, mayor of Ormoc City. Uh, he was originally in his first term as mayor from 2016 to 2019, and he got reelected in 2019. Uh, he obtained his doctorate degree in public administration from CTU. Uh, he has, as I mentioned, and this is true for, this was true for uh, Aaron as well, our distinguished speakers today have a voluminous uh, curriculum vita that I won't have the time to really uh, articulate uh, every one of their accomplishments. So I told myself to just pick three or four notable ones. Uh, he led the construction of the 40 million peso uh, water clarifying plant in Ormoc City. And uh, due to his leadership, Ormoc City was uh, given this award of the best e-government governance business empowerment, uh, which was uh, second place in the nation, which was really quite uh, notable. Uh, of course, Dr. Gomez lives in a parallel universe from science and engineering. He's a very well-known actor and uh, host, as well as a uh, sportsman and athlete. Uh, but we are claiming him in our community uh, in science and engineering and uh, public service. So uh, without further ado, uh, Dr. Gomez, we're, we're very uh, proud to have you here at Paase, and I yield the floor to you. Hi, uh, thank you, doc, Dr. Joel. Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, to other people uh, out of the Philippines, uh, good evening to you. Um, I wonder, Dr. Joel, if you have uh, my presentation right here on the board. Uh, yes, uh, Mon, uh, please load uh, Mayor Gomez's presentation. Let's just wait a minute or so. So, Mayor Gomez, are you in your office in Ormoc City? Yes, I'm here right now at the City Hall. All right. Okay, so while we're waiting, uh, I know that there's a lot of uh, uh, folks who just uh, logged in. Uh, so welcome again to the session and uh, please uh, mm -hmm. post your questions, comments uh, online uh, when you have the opportunity. Thank you. Hey, thank you, uh, Dr. Joel, again. Uh, thank you uh, very much, everybody, for this uh, opportunity I'm presenting to you right now, the technology and social innovation amidst uh, the COVID-19 pandemic that's happening not just in Ormoc City, not just in the Philippines, but all over the world. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, the story of uh, Ormoc City. So let me begin by uh, giving a timeline of... Uh, uh, what's been happening here in Ormoc City. In, in March 9, uh, the Philippines declared a state of uh, public emergency. And uh, as we move fast, uh, on March 11, uh, as mayor of Ormoc City, I organized our own uh, multi-agency COVID-19 task force. No? And in March 12, uh, we organized our emergency response teams at barangay levels and uh, established our protocols in schools and offices. And then the following day, on March 13, we reduced our uh, working days for, for government workers from uh, six days, uh, from five days to uh, four days a week. And then uh, we established our border controls and we required people coming in our borders to sign a health form for uh, those who'd like to enter the city. And then we set up a, um, a COVID-19 uh, hotline so that uh, all people uh, that we have reports will just go through our hotline. And uh, Ormoc City was one of the first uh, few LGUs in the country to declare a community quarantine imposing border control measures. 
this measure was not very popular when we began, no? because a lot of people uh, would uh, come in Ormoc City because Ormoc City is one of the biggest cities here in Region 8, and people come here to do their market, they do their grocery, and by closing down the border and not allowing anyone to come in except for those who live in Ormoc, it was really uh, painful for, for people. And uh, in the beginning, I can say that a lot of people uh, were quite mad with what I, I did. But, you know, as, as mayor for the city, public health is really uh, my uh, my interest. No? And uh, I, I was voted and elected by the people to protect them. And uh, Ormoc City is, uh, was uh, uh, first to impose several additional measures to ensure the lessening the risk of uh, transmission of uh, COVID-19 at the expense of economic activities. Uh, if you'll take a look at the next slide, um, we also uh, prohibited uh, individuals going out of their homes. No, uh, right now uh, the national government uh, requires to people from uh, 21 years old up to 60. But initially, uh, ours was 14 years and uh, up to 65 years old cannot uh, get out of their homes. And uh, on the next slide. Um, you'll see that the, the city uses uh, di digital media as a means for efficient flow of information, both to and from the public, which would be critical in providing garden response and services in any given scenario. So on March 15, as we move forward, all classes from all levels of uh, public and private schools were suspended. And then I imposed a curfew from 10 in the evening up until five in the morning and uh, at the border controls, ambulances carrying patients with respiratory distress were not allowed to enter the city borders, except for those uh, with uh, patients with heart attack, gunshot wounds, stab wounds, or uh, people that needed uh, surgery or giving birth were the ones uh, that were allowed to uh, enter, including those uh, that needed dialysis. Uh, we imposed a citywide uh, community quarantine. And on March uh, 16, as you can see in the timeline, uh, I also suspended the uh, entry of uh, uh, passenger uh, ships not coming from uh, different parts, especially coming from Cebu. I uh, also convened all hospital administrators and representatives. I called on the Department of Health, regional head, and the Department of Interior and local government to discuss management and precautionary measures regarding COVID-19. And I also organized all uh, barangay chairmen to establish protocols for COVID-19 response in their own in their own barangays. So on March 17, <clears throat> in the next slide, uh, a task force uh, reported our first count of uh, uh, PUI. We have 11 cases and uh, we were monitoring about 739 uh, people under monitoring uh, category. My council passed a resolution urging business in Ormoc to prevent overpricing and uh, hoarding, hoarding of supplies. And uh, on March uh, 22, our uh, Environment and Natural uh, Resources uh, Office, together with the General Services Division and the uh, League of uh, Barangays, initiated major housekeeping activities to prepare Ormoc City Hospital to be an isolation facility in preparation for a worst-case scenario of having an increase uh, in number of confirmed COVID-19 cases in the city. So this uh, small hospital that we have but which is really used for uh, for drug rehab center for diagnostic. We convert this into a just specific COVID nineteen hospital, and uh, we call it a unified hospital because three hospitals are working on this uh, uh, unified hospital just to just to accept all uh, COVID patients. No, and on March twenty three, we canceled all all fiesta activities. Uh, fiestas, as you know is a big event in the provinces and it was painful for for us to to uh, cancel our fiesta activities which uh, falls on the third week of june but uh moving on uh, on april 1st we declared um, that ormoc city hospital is ready as an isolation facility in the event that covid 19 cases are confirmed in the city and i ordered all 110 barangays to set up their own isolation center. Later on, I'll, I will show you in, in my uh, uh, spatial uh, page uh, on uh, the number of isolations that we have, uh, the density of people in the city, uh, but I'll, I'll show that uh, later on. And then on April 3rd, <clears throat> as you know, 
when uh, businesses were closed, a lot of people lost their jobs as well. And the uh, Philippines is not a, a very rich country, especially in the provinces. There are a lot of uh, poor people uh, living in in, uh, in outskirts of Metro Manila. And uh, on the next slide, I will show you that uh, we uh, purchased uh, more than 60,000 uh, sacks of rice. And uh, what I did was I asked all the barangay captains to uh, count all the houses they have in every barangay. And I ordered them to give one sack of rice per house. Uh, and that was good for at least uh, six weeks no, for, for their uh, food sustenance. Ang sabi ko sa lang, we'll take care of the rice. You take care of the viand. Kaya nung bahala sa ulam nila, no? uh, And I'll show you in the next slide. Uh, as, as you can see here, this um, this how a uh, barangay isolation center would look like. Now that's a, that's a typical uh, barangay isolation. And uh, I came up with an executive order uh, to establish the operation of uh, barangay isolation units. And uh, on the next slide, I uh, convened the local price coordinating council to uh, closely monitor uh, price movements in the local market, to impose also a price freeze to basic commodities to prevent overpricing you know, by unscrupulous uh, business entities. So the council is uh, composed of multi-agencies uh, spearheaded by the Department of uh, Technology and uh, the Department of Trade, sorry. And then uh, we also uh, imposed a strict regulation in our public market. Initially, I. Uh, I told our policemen not to allow uh, vehicles to park uh, close to the market because uh, we're imposing uh, physical distancing or social distancing so that we'll have more space for, for people walking inside the, the market. So we regulated uh, uh, our parking and I asked uh, our men in uniform also that uh, not to allow people uh, entry if they're not wearing masks. So a no mask, no entry was imposed uh, not just in the complex but also in the whole city. In fact, uh, we have uh, a city ordinance here penalizing people who are not wearing masks. No, uh, if they, they'll be caught, uh, they'll be fined initially, one thousand. Then the next and final uh, warning, they'll uh, be sanctioned with five thousand and uh, six days imprisonment. And on the next slide, I'm showing you sectoral organizations were prepared and mobilized, having invaluable part in the city's holistic response against uh, COVID-19 uh, disease. When I first uh, became mayor in 2016, I told them that I'd like to have a, uh, a participative governance and uh, I involve uh, people from, uh, from different uh, organizations, uh, the academe, the, the scientists uh, in our city, the doctors, all of them should be part of, uh, of our growth. No? And uh, as you can see here in, 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 uh, in this slide, uh, the health sectors included, the uh, micro, small, and uh, uh, medium sectors for, for uh, the economic sectors are, in, are involved, the barangays, our men in uniform, our uh, people from the labor uh, sector, from the industrial sector. They're all part of uh, what we're doing here in Ormoc City. And uh, the city government uh, negotiated with businesses involved in production, trading, and distribution of uh, essential commodities to seek a win-win solution that will also benefit the consuming public, which is really very important nowadays. No? And uh, we also ask, up until now, we ask uh, people, corporations to continuously uh, help us and uh, donate if ever they can, uh, PPEs, masks, uh, uh, oxygen, anything that they, they can help with in our daily, daily operations. Uh, it's not easy to, to uh, run a uh, COVID operation in, in the city and we spend about at least about 600 to 700,000 pesos a day just for our full operation. Uh, knowing that uh, Ormoc City is an agricultural city, so we asked uh, them to, uh, if they can uh, lend their tractors because every night uh, we deployed our, um, our local farmers' uh, assets to help disinfect city streets, as you can see in the next slide. No? Uh, this move really gained a lot of uh, praises from our uh, from our neighbors and uh, from our uh, people right here in or or Mo City. Uh, it was really nice to to see all these tractors moving at night and uh, disinfecting the streets, 
the side roads and uh, some uh, buildings in uh, in uh, Ormoc City. Uh, on the next slide, uh, I um, issued an executive order establishing the Ormoc Ligtas COVID Center. Uh, we are fortunate that uh, we have a uh, National Housing Authority housing that has not yet uh, been uh, uh, transferred or given to beneficiaries. So this is what we use now uh, as our quarantine and isolation uh, area. In this uh, NHA housing, we have 700 homes that can house uh, people coming in from the borders. Anybody that will enter Ormoc City coming from other places, especially from a uh, COVID-affected area, uh, must have a 14-day mandatory quarantine stay in this area. And uh, once they get in, in our uh, Ligtas COVID center, we feed them three times a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So, parang libre ng hotel nila, and then na-quarantine pa sila. Uh, again, th th that's the reason why I said uh, our operation is not, it's not uh, easy because it entails a lot of uh, resources and a lot of people. Uh, we have uh, four major borders and all these borders are manned 24 seven by, uh, by policemen and uh, people from uh, uh, working our uh, LGU. On the next slide, this uh, the, the, the flow chart of, um, on how we uh, uh, bring in our people. So the next slide will show you the border control from travel uh, from uh, different areas. So as you can see, the first one border from travel, except those uh, with positive areas for people under monitoring or people under investigation. Uh, they will be classified where they'll be sent to, whether they'll be at the Barangay Isolation Center or at the Dadrug Isolation Center. Uh, all those coming from, from the region will all be sent to our Barangay Isolation Centers. But those coming out of the region, like coming from Cebu, coming from Manila, will go straight to our NHA housing and they will be uh, given a 14-day uh, mandatory stay. In the next slide, I will show you the, how our uh, uh, LIGTA centers uh, look like. This one uh, evacuation center that we have in uh, Ormoc City, uh, 25 bed capacity. So those that are coming from the region will uh, come in uh, and, and uh, stay in this area or those who would not uh, want to stay in this area, I'll show you in the next slide that uh, we have a uh, memorandum of uh, agreement with uh, different hotels in uh, Ormoc City and uh, they can stay here. No? They have the, they have the, the pleasure of uh, staying in an air-conditioned room, watching Netflix, you know, watching their favorite movies and stuff, uh, but you know, at their own expense. And uh, on the next slide, I'm showing you the start this, how this or uh, COVID hospital that is being run by uh, that being run by by three major hospitals in Ormoc City, namely the Ormoc Doctors Hospital, the Ormoc Farmers Medical Center, and the uh, Gatchelian Hospital. So in this building, we have uh, capacity of uh, 30 beds, specific, specifically for those uh, uh, symptomatic uh, COVID patients. And uh, on the next slide, uh, we created a contact tracing team in uh, Ormoc City. Uh, we have uh, 56 uh, health officers, 47 uh, police officers, and uh, 344 members coming from uh, the Bar Barangay Health Emergency Response uh, Team. And uh, I also uh, 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 came out with an executive order prescribing guidelines on the management of uh, human remains. No? Um, on the next slide, I'll, I'll, I am... I have here's uh, executive order that if a, if somebody will die of COVID, they have to be buried within uh, 12 hours. And if not, uh, if they'll die of uh, other uh, of other causes, they have to be buried within 24 hours. But uh, you know, as time progresses, as we move on, this has changed already. Except for those uh, that will uh, pass away uh, because of uh, COVID, then after 12 hours, they have to be buried. Otherwise. It's the usual uh, seven days uh, burial in, in, in the Philippines. And the next slide, uh, I also uh, came out with, uh, with an ordinance no? approved by my council, a no mask, uh, no entry. And uh, like what I said earlier, if you'll be caught uh, in the city without a mask, you will be fined 1,000 pesos. Uh, in the next uh, slide, 
um, that that is the the penalty, you know, one thousand to five thousand pesos. And then again at the next slide, uh, this is how we uh, manage our market. Uh, we uh, install the hand washing facilities, and uh, everybody should have a QR code. You know? So uh, in in our contact tracing, we moved on from <clears throat> manually signing in or logging in to uh, <clears throat> to QR code. And I'll, I'll discuss that in a while after five minutes. And you know, the transportation system that we have here in Ormo is that we have jeepneys, buses, and uh, tricycles. So if, if you can, if you take a look at the next one, I did this how we uh, we manage our uh, tricycles for social distancing. We have to put an acetate uh, sheet in front of them so that uh, saliva inhalation, you know, uh, cannot be hopefully cannot be transferred from one person to another. And uh, again, wearing a face shield by all drivers uh, is mandatory. And uh, most of the most of the face masks that they use are all donated. No, so. Again, we came out with um, a lot of um, uh, information materials. And uh, the thing here in Ormoc is that if we find out, uh, if we catch them entering the borders without uh, the proper documents, our, our police and our uh, contact tracing team will really look for them. And once we find them, we will bring them to our isolation areas. And uh, that is where they have to stay for 14 days. So in, in, the, in the slide that you will see here, uh, if anyone will be uh, affected by COVID, whether symptomatic or, or uh, asymptomatic, uh, we will have to initially lock down the barangay and where they stay uh, until uh, we're done with our contact uh, uh, tracing report. No? Um, we all, the next uh, slide, please. Uh, Okay, in the next slide, uh, that is, uh, you can see the, the barangay lockdown. So we, we put in uh, policemen, we put in barangay tanods, and we put in uh, some uh, uh, barangay health officers right at the, at the uh, lockdown barangay. And then we move on to the next one. Uh, the, the government came up with a uh, social amelioration program uh, helping people, uh, displaced people without jobs, uh, some funds, no? And uh, in uh, Ormoc City, we were given uh, 8,000 for 60,000 people. And uh, we, we were able to match them well. As you can see here, this is our Superdome. Uh, this is a social distancing that uh, uh, we're doing for every time that we have uh, a program or a program for uh, social amelioration. Uh, and then if we can move on to the next slide. I uh, <clears throat> came out with a quarantine pass for everybody. Uh, mandating people, only one person from each family can go out of their homes. No? Uh, they can only uh, leave their home, homes if they need to go to the market, buy medicines, um, or uh, get essential things that are uh, needed in their homes, no? Uh, as you can see, uh, one uh, quarantine pass is only good for one person coming from the family. And uh, because, because it's difficult for, for people to be moving from one place to another. And, uh, you know, our mock is such a, such a big area. We're almost as big as Metro Manila. And we only have uh, one central market. So on the next slide, I'm showing you that uh, we, uh, came out with the market on wheels. So we have uh, vendors coming in groups, going to the different barangays on uh, different days, uh, selling everything that you'll, you'll find in, uh, in the main market, but on a smaller scale. So we call that, uh, we call that market on wheels. And you know, up to this day, we're still doing it and it's very successful and uh, very uh, convenient for those people living in, uh, in uh, the different barangays. Uh, we also had, uh, I also came out with uh, the Bulayan sa Barangay. The, on the following slides, you can see that uh, I uh, encourage people to plant vegetables. Since they're not working, they're not doing uh, uh, a lot of things at home. So those who have uh, open lots of their places, 
uh, I gave the seeds and now they're uh, planting the vegetables. So if you can see the next, uh, the next slide, the next two slides, uh, people are happy because the vegetables are growing. Uh, and we call this uh, hutanun sa ormo. So we, uh, this Mayor Gomez, Mayor Gomez, pardon me. If you could kindly speak closer to the microphone, pardon me, oh, if you okay, could. Okay. So as you can see in the next slide, uh, it, it came up with this uh, program, Utanon Sa Ormox, and this being uh, implemented in uh, over 80 barangays in, uh, in Ormox City. And uh, on, a, on a regular basis, uh, I, I call, I call uh, people to, uh, to meet with us. And uh, on the next slide, please. Uh, I had a port management coordinating meeting for uh, Lake Ted Biliran Islands in uh, anticipation of the opening of ports uh, in, in the region, uh, region eight and region uh, seven, which uh, covers Cebu. Uh, a lot of uh, local government units were involved. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the Leyte province, Hilongos and uh, Southern Leyte. Uh, and the next slide again. Uh, so I came out again with, uh, with a recovery task force that was created on April 20. Uh, for the Balik Provincia program and the Hatid Provincia initiatives. And you can see uh, when they started coming in, they were all tested. Uh, they had to uh, sign in and uh, they were all assisted properly by, uh, by men in uniform. Uh, and then uh, we began opening our borders in Ormoc City. Uh, in the next slide, you will see <clears throat> that uh, each and every town near nearby Ormoc City were given a border pass. Uh, why? If you'll take a look at the border pass, you'll see that there's Merida, Matagob, the names of uh, the different uh, municipalities. Uh, we did that purposely so that in case there'll be a uh, local transmission in their area, let's say, for example, in Kananga, it'll be easy for us to, uh, to just close the, to uh, not to accept uh, people with uh, uh, border pass getting uh, their uh, specific uh, municipality. And then I issued also several uh, executive orders defining guidelines uh, on uh, COVID-19 response in Ormoc. No? Uh, we also have a uh, donation drive. On the next two slides, you'll see that uh, a lot of uh, people have, uh, have been donating to, to Ormoc City, not just funds, but uh, uh, they've been donating to us uh, supplies and materials, the next slide please, uh, food and uh, non-food items for our COVID-19 response. Uh, what I want to show you, the next slide, is our uh, web-based uh, geospatial uh, risk database for COVID-19 pandemic response and recovery project. Uh, as you can see in the next slide, uh, Ormoc City's uh, close contact uh, PUMs and suspects for PUIs from uh, March 16 up until uh, July 27. Initially, when, uh, when the Hatid Provincia came in and uh, when, when people started coming home, we received almost 2,000 people, repatriates, coming in from uh, different areas. That's why uh, from, uh, from uh, June 3, uh, from uh, March uh, 16 up until, uh, uh, until April, you can see this really big rise. No? But uh, as we entered in uh, May, uh, in April, May, up until uh, June, uh, it has tapered. And then, pag balik ulit ng balik probinsya and hatid probinsya tulong, again, there's a, a rise in, uh, in uh, entries of uh, PUMs and PUIs. In the next slide, I will show you the epidemic curve of uh, confirmed uh, COVID cases. Uh, the, the green the green uh, colors that you will see are for uh, locally stranded individuals coming in uh, or Mok City and uh, the light blue, you see the OFWs coming in and uh, pink color are for local transmission that we had here in Ormok City. But uh, luckily the local transmission we had only happened inside our uh, quarantine and isolation area because uh, some nurses were, uh, uh, were con uh, had a close contact with uh, those uh, with uh, COVID and you know, they were affected. And in the next slide, let me show you our, uh, our uh, online. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is for uh, the case dumping time for uh, our uh, online uh, dashboard layers. If you'll see, these are more city. We have 110 barangays. 
and uh, the different colors will show you the density of uh, people living in each barangay. So the darkest one is where the center of uh, Ormoc is. Now that, that, that's the main city. And the next slide is uh, the population density per, per barangay. Uh, and uh, the, the third slide, I'm showing you the localized lockdown mapping. We use this in case we have to close down our uh, barangays in, in any of the 110 uh, barangays all over or mock city. And uh, the next slide, uh, like I mentioned a while ago, uh, these are our security border points. Uh, the, red, the red colors are the, the border controls of Ormoc City. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six. These are the main areas from, uh, from the north, the mountainside, Valencia, and, uh, and the San Juan area. And the two uh, small ones are the port area of uh, Ormoc City. This uh, area uh, is where people coming from Bohol and Cebu enter. So next slide, I'm showing you our uh, geospatial uh, dashboard for uh, suspect cases recorded. Although all of these people came from the MGA housing or from our COVID hospitals, but in these uh, colors, you will see that this, this is where they live in Ormoc City. Just in case we have to backtrack, we know exactly where they live and which area of Ormoc City they are from. And uh, the next one will show you the probable cases recorded. And we have 10 of them as of uh, July 27, yeah, July 27, just uh, the other day. Uh, and the next one, the next uh, slides, please. Uh, you will see the confirmed cases recorded. No, We've had 64 COVID cases in Ormoc City. Uh, they're now all well. They're now uh, all uh, in their uh, homes. Uh, although we've had two deaths in Ormoc City, but they're not from Ormoc. They are from uh, either Kananga, or a next next town, Alberta. So all of these uh, people, if we need to see them or if they need the doctors need to uh, check on them, we know exactly where they are. And the uh, iso isolation facilities, as you can see in this slide, we have uh, uh, four major ones and uh, three uh, smaller three, three small hotels. And the next slide you'll see of the uh, the next slide you'll see our barangay isolation units. So all of these uh, red dots are all for barangays. The ones that stay here are coming from the regions, no? So that, 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 that's how more or less we, uh, <clears throat> that is more or less how we uh, control uh, people coming in from different areas. And um, the last slide for that, I'm showing you the re relief efforts uh, on how we distributed our uh, uh, sacks of rice to the different uh, homes in Ormoc City. Initially, we gave uh, 65,000 sacks of rice for our first batch. And then just about two weeks ago, uh, we uh, gave them another, another sack of rice to uh, 65,000 uh, households in uh, Ormoc City. And uh, we also came out with our uh, QR code for, for contact tracing. And then we also uh, uh, established our uh, own uh, molecular and diagnostic center for RT and PCR testing. Um, just for just to uh, keep our mock safe. In the following slides, please, uh, together with the Energy Development Corporation, uh, together with the uh, uh, hospital and support with uh, the IAPF, no, the Interagency Task Force of uh, the National Government. Uh, the next slide, you will see that uh, we already uh, signed a uh, memorandum of uh, agreement, and our testing center will uh, open. Uh, on uh, August uh, August 15, uh, we're just waiting for the machines to come in and uh, to be calibrated. So in that picture, you'll see uh, <clears throat> people working together for one good cause to fight uh, COVID-19. In the next slides, please. How did this, the president of, uh, <clears throat> of uh, EDC? Uh, you'll see here in the next slide, uh, we came up with our own uh, QR code for uh, contact tracing. No? You see, we call it the safe or mock uh, QR code. Uh, and uh, it, it's easy for them to just uh, uh, get the QR code system to identify themselves. And we use this as they enter the borders, as they enter uh, uh, the stores, as they enter the groceries, everything, as they enter any establishments in Ormoc City for easy contact tracing. So you'll see in the next slide, 
<clears throat> uh, there's uh, about 172,000, almost 173,000 already have uh, registered in our QR code system. And all over MOC, we have 6,800 scanners. No, just just yesterday, we scanned about 34,000 people, and uh, who, who's been using and, and in uh, coming in in and out restaurants, building facilities. So we've had a total scan of about almost a million already since we we started. So in the following slides, you will see that uh, uh, these are our total. Uh, Daily scans, no. On, we do this on a daily basis, and in the next uh, slide, you'll see uh, most of the most establishments that uh, people go to. So you can see that Robinson's uh, Robinson's uh, department store is still uh, number one here. A lot of people go to the mall. Uh, you can see a lot of people uh, go to uh, the grocery. They go to uh, you know retail shops. So. If you take a look at it, if you break it down, that is how it's going to to uh, look like. So that is our uh, QR code system. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Joel. Thank you so much for for this opportunity for showing the people uh, how we do things and how we work yes. it out in uh, Ormoc City. You know, we're not a very rich city, but we make do with uh, how good our people here in Ormoc are. So thank you so much, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mayor Gomez. You gave a very comprehensive uh, presentation. I think your presentation just underscored the fact that uh, being a mayor of a city anywhere in the world, even in the Philippines, or particularly in the Philippines, uh, really uh, is to be a chief executive officer. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that in certain aspects is even more challenging than being a CEO of a, of a private company. Uh, if not, you're just joining not, us, it's not uh, easy. It's not easy to. It's not easy to be a mayor. You know, uh, the the mayor really is like a uh, psychiatrist. No? We try to solve things on a daily basis. And the thing is, when you solve one problem, another problem will come in because of how you solved it. So that that's how it is here. Things are revolved that way. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. So if you're just joining us, because some people just join us, uh, you're joining the, the special plenary lecture of Paase, and uh, Mayor Gomez just uh, finished his presentation. If you have any questions, please post them, and I'll make sure that I get the written responses to your questions. But as host, I get to ask Mayor Gomez a couple of questions. So I really appreciated your uh, philosophy of a participative governance meaning to say talking with the various stakeholders of your city uh, to make sure that you arrive at the best solution. Oh, I, I, lost I can't hear you. Okay. Can you hear me now? Hold on. I, I think right. I lost you. Sorry, I, 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 uh, I can't okay. hear you. Okay. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Can, yes, I can hear you well, yes. Anyway, I was just saying that I really appreciated your principle of a participative governance. Okay, I hope we, we didn't lose him. <laughs> All right, uh, in the meantime, okay, there he is. Mary Gomez, can you hear me? All right, so what we can do, he's having some technical problems, is I'm sure he's gonna come back on. Uh, we could uh, proceed with our lectures and then I can ask him a few questions after my presentation. So Mayor Gomez, if you can hear me, we're just gonna proceed with the uh, proceedings and we'll get back to you when you get back on. All right, so Mon, if I may request, please, if you, if you could uh, show my uh, presentation. Uh, each of our uh, speakers is speaking about 30 minutes, but I'm going to shorten my presentation to only about 15 or 20 minutes uh, uh, to give more deference to the other speakers. And also because I'll be speaking as well in a session to, oh, there he is. Okay. So Mayor Gomez, if you can hear me, I'll get back to you after this presentation. All right, so my presentation is how indoor vertical farms foster resilience and sustainability amid pandemics and a changing climate. So at the uh, 
at the start of this uh, program, I mentioned about uh, the fourth mm. industrial revolution, where you have the convergence of the physical, the digital, and the biological. And really vertical farming is an excellent example of an area where you have the fourth industrial revolution, innovative technologies converging together. Uh, Mayor Gomez, we're proceeding, but I'll get back to you after my presentation to ask you my questions. Uh, so please stay on. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so vertical farming, next slide, had its uh, beginnings really with uh, uh, the space programs of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA, in the United States. And to be fair, also with the Soviet Space Agency in the former Union of Soviet, uh, Union of Soviet Socialist Republic, or USSR. Next uh, slide. I had a privilege of uh, doing my postdoc at NASA Kennedy Space Center in the 1990s uh, through the US National Research Council uh, postdoctoral fellowship. Next, please. And uh, my uh, designated unit at NASA Kennedy Space Center was Advanced Life Support uh, Division, which really is, in simple terms, uh, space farming. Uh, next uh, slide, please. So in the future, NASA is going to deploy a uh, manned mission, not only to the moon, but even on Mars. And of course, the astronauts need to uh, survive for a uh, long duration of time. And so uh, the most economically feasible plan is for them to be able to grow their own food on site. Um, and so uh, when I was at NASA, this was in the 1990s, uh, LEDs were just coming up in the market. And so uh, this facility at Kennedy Space Center was still using uh, high pressure sodium lamps. Uh, you have wheat here that's being grown hydroponically, that's in the absence of soil, uh, using exclusively uh, designed uh, nutrient solution uh, to be optimal to the, uh, the growth, the yield, and the quality of the crop that's being grown. And in this case, that is wheat. And NASA has really successfully demonstrated growing all types of food crops, from cereal to salad crops, tomatoes, uh, sweet potatoes, whatever. Uh, in hydroponic systems in a very close environment system. So this is uh, this chamber here, we call it the biomass production chamber, was completely airtight. Uh, there was a leakage of about 0.001% uh, in terms of air. Uh, the temperature is regulated, of course, the relative humidity is controlled, uh, the light level is controlled, the light quality, uh, the light period per day, and so on and so forth. So it's really tightly controlled. And so uh, not a surprise, you're able to really maximize uh, and optimize the productivity, as well as the yield, as well as the quality of the crops that you're growing. Next slide, please. All right, so here's another picture. They're growing lettuce. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is uh, potatoes uh, that were grown hydroponically uh, in the same uh, demonstration by mass production chamber. Uh, next slide, please. And again, everything is uh, contained in a hydroponic uh, vessel. So when I moved to the University of Arizona after I got hired, uh, I continued my work on uh, space life support. And I had uh, international collaborations, including in Japan, uh, because uh, the first country that really commercialized vertical farming or indoor farming uh, was Japan. Uh, and this, this was actually visiting a professor, Professor Kozai, uh, at Chiba University uh, when I had a Japan Society for the Promotion of Science Fellowship. And uh, they treated me with his grad students and the grad students were partying like it was 1999. And in fact, because it was December 1999. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. And uh, I got invited as well by some of the uh, pioneering vertical farming operators in Japan. Uh, this one was with Cosmo Plant, uh, which was in Tokyo in Narita, uh, that is close to the international airport. Next slide. And, and now uh, in uh, 2018, 2019, the last few years, uh, vertical farming is still thriving, uh, particularly in Japan. Uh, as shown by these uh, slides here. Uh, this one is uh, the company spread, which is in Tokyo. The previous slide uh, was a company called Mirai. Uh, and again, imagine a warehouse 
that is completely closed and you're growing these crops uh, without soil using liquid nutrient solutions. You're not dependent on sunlight. Uh, you're only uh, providing uh, lighting uh, using light emitting diodes at controlled intensities and at controlled uh, wavelengths or light qualities. So you can really optimize the uh, productivity of these crops. And that goes to show that your production becomes independent of the weather, the climate, the location, the geography. Basically, you can do this on Earth, you can do that on Mars or on the moon as well. It really doesn't matter. Next slide, please. And if you could do it twice. And this one is in College Station, Texas. Uh, that was iBiotherapeutics. Uh, they're growing plants, however, they're not growing the plants as crops or food, uh, but those crops are genetically engineered so that they produce insulin. So that was really for uh, medical application or production or pharmaceutical production. Uh, here's another example of the company. Next slide, please. Uh, and do it three times. I'm just showing you here some real companies uh, that have commercialized uh, vertical farming. This one is in Norway. Next, please. Uh, even in the United States, particularly in the uh, tri-state area in the Northeast, New York City, New Jersey, there's, there's a lot of vertical farms that have cropped up uh, that are operating uh, commercially now. Next slide, please. And this one is in China, and China is a major player in vertical farming as well. Next slide, please. Uh, and, and I had a reunion with Professor Kazai two years ago in China. Next slide, please. And uh, my group has been working on, on this particular type of vertical farm, which we refer to as the minimally structured modular and prefabricated vertical farm. It's like a Lego structure that is composed of uh, uniform building blocks. And the building block could be a shipping container. Next slide, please. And you can assemble these uh, building blocks in many uh, possible uh, permutations of geometric configurations. Next slide, please. So this is a, a demonstration shipping uh, container uh, that my students have retrofitted to be a unit for a vertical farm. Next slide, please. Uh, this is here at the University of Arizona in Tucson. Uh, next slide, these are some of my students. And I'm gonna show you the uh, interior of the uh, uh, shipping container. Uh, next slide. So you can see these, uh, uh, these growing structures uh, that uh, are generic and some of them we have designed and we have patented like this one, we refer to as the V-Hive uh, uh, green box. Uh, again, in terms of the technical details of this, I'll, I'll describe those in the session that I'll be participating in tomorrow. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. So I think you get the idea that we're growing plants uh, under highly optimized and controlled environments. Next slide, please. And one more. Okay. Uh, and here's another innovation that we have developed, uh, which is this Go Vertical Farm, which really uh, is an automated system. Uh, so that you don't need workers essentially to go into where the plants are being grown. You can just command each of these units uh, through the robot upon which that growing system is uh, standing or sitting. And so you can really control this remotely uh, and the operation will stay extremely clean uh, and free from any contamination. Next slide, please. Uh, make it to another one, please. All right, so I'd like to focus on this. Uh, I'm thankful to the Department of Science and Technology of the Philippines for approving my Balik Scientist uh, Fellowship. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and of course, uh, where else to spend that, uh, but in a place uh, that really uh, bore the brunt of uh, one of the biggest uh, typhoons uh, in recorded history, which is Typhoon Haiyan. Next slide, please. And. Uh, of course, the center of that, the epicenter was Tacloban City in Leyte. Next slide, please. And so I'll be spending my uh, Balik Scientist program, next slide, uh, at Eastern Visaya State University on the invitation of uh, uh, their uh, associate dean or vice president, sorry, for uh, research, uh, Dr. Kaintik, 
as well as the president, uh, Dr. Uh, Dominador Aguirre. And this is through the facilitation of our PASIC colleague, Alvin Kulaba at uh, De La Salle University. Uh, next slide, please. And, and the, the goal here is to be able to engineer resilience as well as sustainability. Next slide, please. All right, next slide, a few more. So this is uh, ABSU or Eastern Visayas State University. Uh, the gentleman to my left in the picture is the president, Dr. Uh, Aguirre. Uh, and of course, our PASI colleagues, Alvin Kulaba, uh, national scientist, uh, Luli Cruz, as well as uh, Anne Villalobos. Uh, next slide, please. And this was in our mock city, by the way, uh, that's big stadium uh, last year when we had a conference. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, that is Dr. Kainti right there. So, uh, of course, uh, I realized that uh, we've been working here in Arizona on highly uh, sophisticated systems, which are not directly translatable or applicable to uh, conditions in the Philippines. And so we are going to, or my intention is to be able to design and develop a frugal engineered vertical farm that would be appropriate for uh, producers and farmers uh, in Leyte, including in Tacloban, and hopefully in Oromoc as well. Uh, next slide, please. And, and of course, we're gonna be engineering this. Uh, we're going to uh, look at the uh, fluid dynamics of the air movements inside so that we can really regulate uh, the temperature, humidity, and other important uh, variables. Next slide, please. Uh, and, and this is particularly true, <clears throat> as I mentioned, because uh, again, Leyte has become the epicenter of climate change uh, in the Philippines and perhaps in the world. And so it's very important to uh, provide capacity building for its farmers uh, to be able uh, to grow crops in a resilient, reliable and sustainable manner so that their uh, way of life or their, their work, uh, their uh, uh, production is not uh, at the mercy of the uh, changing climate or weather. And, and of course, I realize as well that in Ormoc, as well as uh, in perhaps other parts of Leyte, uh, renewable energy is available not just in the form of solar energy, but also geothermal energy. So we could really uh, potentially tap into this available renewable energy uh, to make our operation uh, really sustainable. Next slide, please. And uh, these are some of the teams at uh, De La Salle University in Manila uh, who will be working with me uh, together with Dr. Kulaba. Uh, yes, I just want to point out that one is Elmer Dadios and this one is Edwin. Uh, Edwin. <laughs> Next slide, please. <laughs> Sibinko, sorry. And, and this is uh, OG. Uh, this is Urban Greens and this is Ralph uh, Becker. Uh, he is a commercial operator uh, working on vertical farming in Makati and uh, we will be involving him as well because uh, we're not interested in just research and development. We wanna be able to commercialize our efforts. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, we will be working with uh, farmers associations in Leyte. You see, one of the uh, features that I really like about Leyte is uh, that uh, they have uh, farmers associations uh, whose formations really were catalyzed by the governor of Leyte, uh, Governor Patilia, and one of which is this uh, farmers association called Villa uh, Consuelo. Next uh, slide, please. So this is a, an association of farmers. Uh, they banded together and uh, they received uh, help in terms of technology input, most important market linkage as uh, facilitated by Governor Patilia as well as help them in terms of uh, doing a business model. Uh, next slide, please. And that's Alex Alborita, who is the, uh, basically the CEO of these farmers associations. So they're growing uh, high uh, value crops, of course, outdoors. Uh, next slide. And I was just speaking with uh, Mr. Alborita yesterday, and he told me that they're also growing some crops in a semi greenhouse uh, structure, which of course is very rudimentary like this and like the next slide, please. So they're growing carrots, they're growing uh, strawberry, next slide, please, and uh, cauliflower and a lot of these high value crops. So they're already starting of thinking and organic as well. They're already starting to transition into 
a semi-controlled environment uh, production system. And so that's where uh, myself as well are, as my collaborators at VLSU would come in, in terms of really uh, providing them capacity building uh, to develop further their indoor agriculture uh, engineered systems. Here's another Farmers Association of Lagrangia. Next slide, please. Uh, with, next slide, which uh, we visited, uh, meeting Alvin Kulaba and Luli Cruz about two or three years ago. And uh, this is the owner and operator of the Farmers Association. And next slide, please. And of course, we visited uh, uh, Mayor Gomez uh, last year in his office. And I haven't talked to him about this yet, but hopefully uh, we can discuss having a collaboration in terms of vertical farming demonstration in um, uh, or mock as well. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the governor, uh, Governor Dominic uh, Petilia, who's really uh, very uh, business-minded and uh, very uh, earnest in terms of providing capacity building for uh, the farmers of Leyte uh, to be able to uh, band together into associations so that there is economy of scale, helping them with business model and helping them with uh, linkage with the market so that their agricultural operation really becomes economically feasible. And so that provides opportunity for these uh, organized farmers to really grow and to really uh, earn income and, and, and make their income grow over time. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so ultimately, what, we'd like, what I'd like to explore together with EBSU and all the other stakeholders is uh, to look into establishing an indoor agriculture innovation economic zone in Leyte. I just checked and I think there is a PESA uh, initiated uh, agro-industrial economic zone in Leyte, one in Leyte and one in Samar. And so I need to do my homework in terms of really understanding what they're currently doing and how effective it is. And so we hope to link with them uh, so that we can establish this uh, bustling and thriving uh, and successful economic zone uh, that is focused on indoor agriculture because as the uh, climate continues to change, particularly in the Philippines, uh, there is more need for farmers to have that uh, access and even the option of moving indoors uh, to be able to have a resilient and sustainable uh, means of crop production. Now, Next slide, please. I believe uh, we're approaching the end. Yes, I just want to acknowledge my uh, grad students and visiting scholars here at the University of Arizona. We call ourselves bioimagineers because we're really uh, using not only tools of science and technology, but our innovative imagination to be able to design uh, really useful solutions, innovative and valuable solutions to a lot of the uh, uh, grand challenges that we are facing uh, today as a community of nations uh, on the planet. Next slide, please. And I believe the next slide is the last one. Yes. So, uh, all right. So that is my email address if you are interested in contacting me. So thank you all very much uh, for uh, listening. So I'm the host, so I have the prerogative of not, not asking myself questions. But back to you, uh, Mayor Gomez. Can you hear me now? Uh, yes. I can hear you now. So one thing I really appreciated, one thing I appreciated about your philosophy as mayor is your philosophy of a participative governance, meaning to say that you talk with the va various stakeholders of the city so that together you can come up with an optimized solution and as well as an optimized implementation of that solution. So one of the things that you mentioned is that you negotiated uh, with some of the businesses there uh, who are doing production, uh, trading, as well as distribution of essential goods uh, so that despite the pandemic, these essential goods will remain available to your uh, citizens. Yeah. So I'm not gonna ask you to reveal to us anything confidential, but if you can describe to us in general terms, what are some of these general terms that you negotiated with these uh, companies or businesses? Well, uh, of well no, no, number one, I uh, negotiated with them, especially with the stores and the groceries, if uh, they can focus on uh, using uh, uh, buying supplies from our farmers, and especially vegetables and uh, high-value crops and uh, 
so far it's been working well with our farmers and uh, they're quite happy with the uh, with the outcome of, uh, of that uh, negotiation because uh, before they used to uh, import a lot of uh, vegetables from from the different areas uh, in the region and uh, in uh, even as far as uh, Baguio and La Trinidad but uh, with our uh, focus on agriculture in the city we've been producing a lot of uh, high quality vegetables and uh, I was able to use that as a leverage uh, in right. uh, telling them to you know, to uh, make use of our farmers and their products. That, that is quite commendable. Thank you. Oh, thank uh, you. So one, la one last comment. When you were having some difficulty uh, hearing me was uh, your, your very comprehensive presentation really underscored the fact that as mayor, you are chief executive officer of your uh, your city. And uh, it's like being a musical conductor and you have to conduct various <laughs> sections of an orchestra so that you can make uh, harmonious uh, music. So as, as a public administrator and mayor, what did you find most challenging in your role in terms of doing that orchestration, in terms of doing that coordination uh, so that you, your city really functions well and harmoniously? Uh, I'm a results-oriented person and I've accepted the fact that I do not know a lot. I do not know everything. So I, I'm, 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 I'm strong with the things that I know. And when I'm weak on, on, uh, on other issues, I really seek the help of other people. And that's how uh, I've uh, been running my administration. So I'm not a medical doctor, so I'm, I don't have much knowledge on that. I'm, I'm a doctor in public administration, so that, that's my strong point. Uh, in running a city, uh, you have to be multifaceted. Right. And uh, to be able to accomplish that, you really need the help and support of uh, the different groups. So that, that's how I, I, uh, I run my administration, through the help of a lot of people, through the use of my engineers here in our, in our uh, city hall and uh, all the people that uh, who's knowledgeable in uh, helping us improve the lives of our people in Ormoc. I think that is really very important. And I think that that applies not just to you as a public administrator, but to us as scientists and engineers as well. We always need intellectual honesty. In other words, we know what we know. And a lot of times we know, know what we don't know. And, and, and I think and we you know have what? to be very you know, honest you know, you know, Joel, about that. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to tell them if there are things that I do not know. And I will tell them Correct. that the reason why I'm talking to them is because I want to do something. I want, I want, uh, I want results on, on something that I want. And uh, right. that, that's how we, we work together, by, by being open and being honest. Exactly, right. Thank you for that very important nugget. I think that's a very important moral to remember uh, by everyone. So thank you so much, uh, Mayor Gomez, and please thank stay you. on for the uh, awarding section of our plenary. So we're moving on now with uh, the last but not least uh, presenters of uh, our uh, lecture uh, portion of the plenary. Uh, Mon, if I could kindly request you to please display the introductory slide uh, for uh, Dr. Chris and Maribic, uh Bernido. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, uh, their CVs, their curriculum vitae are so voluminous that I, again, limited myself to just pointing out three or four of the uh, essential or notable accomplishments uh, that they have uh, made or achieved. Um, so here we go. So I just want to point out these uh, accomplishments. But these are just, again, the tips of the, the tip of the icebergs. <laughs> so uh, they are president, uh, Chris, you, uh, Dr. Chris, you are the president, and Dr. Maravik, she's the basic education uh, directress of this institution that they co-founded, uh, the Central Visayan Institute of uh, Foundation, or CBIF, in Bahol. Uh, they both obtained uh, their PhDs in theoretical physics and their master's in physics from the State University of New York, Albany in the United States and their bachelor's uh, in physics at the University of the Philippines, uh, Diliman. So without further ado, I, I yield the floor to uh, the two of you, please. Hello everyone. First of all, we'd like to thank Dr. Giselle Concepcion for her kind invitation for us to share some of our experiences and recommendations concerning education. We'll be talking about the CVIF Dynamic Learning Program, which has been shown to be an efficient, low-cost solutions for pandemic scenarios. 
let me talk about the outstanding questions during a pandemic. This would be the concerns of parents, of uh, stakeholders, students, uh, local government units, and so on. So a question would be, can students still learn well when there is a shelter-in-place advisory to slow down the spread of infection during a pandemic? Another question would be, can superior learning outcomes still be achieved even when there is no internet connectivity? This is especially true for countries like the Philippines where there is very limited access to the internet. Is it necessary for parents to guide their children for their lessons? How about advanced topics? So I think parents would be concerned how they would be able to tutor or mentor their children if they're taking advanced algebra, calculus, chemistry, organic chemistry, and so on. Another question would be, um, can we bypass the worldwide lack of qualified STEM teachers in basic education? This problem was already present before the pandemic, and it's still now a burning issue uh, at present. At present. Are we taking advantage of new results from new, the neurosciences to improve education? And finally, for especially for countries, many countries like the Philippines with limited budgets, is there a low cost educational pro program that allows poorer nations to compete with budget intensive educational systems of richer nations? Otherwise, if we will all be depending on big budget programs, then poorer nations will always be at a loss. Now, what we will be talking about this time would be the CVIF Dynamic Learning Program, which we conceptualized and implemented in 2002, so 18 years ago. The CVIF Dynamic Learning Program is a systems approach to process-induced learning. We call it process-induced learning in contrast to teacher-induced learning, which is the more conventional approach. The Dynamic Learning Program, or DLP, also incorporates 21st century skills such as critical thinking, problem solving, collaboration, communication. And the program in the past, within the past 18 years has been applied at the elementary, secondary, and tertiary level. So we have also written quite a few papers on the CVIF dynamic learning program. Now the DLP has core components or essential features, non-negotiable features, and Chris will talk about these. To look at the details of the CVIF dynamic learning program, or DLP for short, there are four pillars, four essential components, which are actually non-negotiables. One would be the parallel learning homes, which is more or less automatic during lockdowns or when there is a shelter in place. And the importance of that is it automatically limits teacher intervention. The second component is the so-called activity-based learning by doing. And this involves the LAS, uh, which is the learning activity sheets, and you will see more of the LAS in a little while. The third component is that the students will have an in-house comprehensive portfolio where they file everything, quizzes, all the LAS, LAS, and so on. And very important also is strategic rest, uh, which is needed by growing children or even adolescents or even adults. So. Let's uh, start with the first component, which is the parallel learning homes. You can imagine the parallel learning homes where in individual students will be with their families or uh, with their brothers and sisters. And they, they will be doing the LAS and there will be no teacher intervention when they are accomplishing the LAS. And in the CVIF DLP, Tutoring by parents is not necessary. But after one week, once they accomplish a, a week-long set of activities, learning activities for all subjects, then this LAS will be collected so that they will be assessed by the subject teacher, by the expert teacher. Now, the second component is about this uh, learning by doing through the learning activity sheets or LAS. The structure of the LAS is relatively simple. 
it should be one concept, one page, and that should be contained in a uh, with font 14 in just one one page of, of paper. And it starts with a short concept digest for whatever topic, for whatever year level, you have a short concept digest, followed by an example, an illustration, and then you end with a few questions. And the first question really has to be easy because we're also targeting even the challenge learners. So this LAS would then be would lead towards the required competency. It could be the Department of Education or we call it the DepEd. So it's a the idea is that any complex task, whether calculus or physics or chemistry, can be divided into very small steps. And each step could even be further divided if you wish. And so these small steps will be copied by hand by the students and it, and the, the idea is that this collection of LAS would lead to whatever the Department of Education would require to the target competency. In the CVIFDLP, this learning activity sheets, uh, we say that an ideal LAS, an ideal learning activity, is an LAS where zero inter intervention is needed. There's no uh, lecture required. That's why it is immune to lockdowns because uh, lockdowns or shelter in place essentially mean that the teacher cannot be in contact with, with the students, especially if uh, there is no internet connectivity. And by design, all LAS, no introductory lecture is required by design. And so the, the, the students will have to look at this new topic and they will have, they will have to compre comprehend it and it develops their critical thinking and problem solving abilities and they try to answer it they could commit a mistake but at that stage that's still formative learning so it's okay to commit mistakes now one of the key pillars in the CVIF DLP which ma made it successful to our view is that the students will copy by hand from the activity title to the learning target to the short concept digest all the way to the question uh, answering the questions and let me cite one paper the Armeni this paper is from a psychological science paper published by Mueller and Oppenheimer and they said in the paper that note taking with a pen rather than a laptop gives students a better grasp of, of, uh, of the subject so note taking is superior than even uh, keyboarding in a laptop and this study in fact was focused on more than 300 students at Princeton and University of California, Los Angeles. The Miller and Oppenheimer study demonstrated that students who write out their notes on paper actually learn more in each study. Those who wrote out their notes by hand had a stronger conceptual understanding and were more successful in applying and integrating the material than those who took notes with their laptops. Another earlier study, uh, that's why we require that all the activities have, have to be copied and answered by hand, is that writing the activities activates both the psychomotor and visual faculties of the brain. Uh, Professor Hebb, long time ago, already said that neurons that fire together are wired together, while neurons that fire out of sync lose their link. So after writing all this learning activity sheets, the students to teach them also organization because organization is a treasured skill in the 21st century. They will compile it in a comprehensive student portfolio which could be color coded like uh, yellow could be science, white for math, blue for English or, or whatever. So we are, we are already telling you the different components. We started with the parallel learning homes. Then we talk about the uh, learning by doing through the copying of the learning activities. And then we have the comprehensive portfolio. And strategic rest simply means that they should do nothing beyond the LAS and whatever they do is, is already optional. So does this work? Well, actually, since 2002, um, we have been monitoring the framework of this dynamic learning program. And for example, two, three years ago, um, 25 students 
from our school pass the University of the Philippines college admission test. And uh, this is, of course, the primary university in the Philippines based on rankings. And we'd like to note, and then followed by 27 students uh, uh, the year after, that uh, CVIF is actually in a third class municipality. It's way far from the nearest city. It's 63 kilometers from the nearest city. And the tuition is very low in academic year 2019 to 2020. For junior high school, it's just 10,500 pesos for the whole year, and then 13,000 pesos for the whole year for, for senior high. Uh, CVIF is just a regular uh, DepEd school. It's a mission school, and our admission is very liberal. And I, I suspect some of the students are even non-readers. Maybe I would also just like to add that uh, these students were, were, that was a pre-pandemic scenario. And at that time, strategic rest in the DLP consisted of the zero homework policy. So absolutely no homework uh, for the students from their grade seven till grade 12. And also we have one day a week, uh, which would be for lighter subjects like PE, music, arts, health, or whatever. And uh, so we had this number of students. Now a school, a typical school in provincial areas like ours would only have maybe around five students who would pass if they're serious about it. Yeah. And there are a lot of performance indicators actually through the years. And some of the performance indicators are those that uh, from the monitoring of students after they have gone through college and, and so on and so forth. So let me just show you an example. So um, we have a student, for example, Ronald Yoren. Uh, he's now doing his PhD at ETH Zurich. And which is, of course, if you look at the QS ranking, it's number one in the field that he entered, which is Earth and Marine Sciences. There is also Madeline Naiga, who is doing his her PhD in physics in a joint program by uh, Max Planck Institute and the University of Dresden. And uh, another example would be Jesha Kasenyas, who graduated uh, BS Anthropology from the University of California, Berkeley. And so from the very beginning, our target has really been high. And the idea is that with minimum resources, if you have a very high target, then you compensate your lack of resources with a good strategy. And that's what we have been doing with a, with a CIA in, in Bohol. Yeah. So how about in a pandemic scenario? The features of the CVIF DLP is actually appropriate and very suitable uh, in a pandemic scenario. So as you have, as we have mentioned, the key is really the learning activity sheets to be copied by hand by its student. And this could be distributed to the different houses, to the different students. If, if they have uh, internet connectivity, then you can do this online. But if they don't have uh, internet connectivity, then these learning activity sheets will be printed and distributed to the students through some designated drop off points. It could be uh, the school, some uh, local government unit and so on and so forth. So once these LAS are distributed, then the students without teacher intervention can work on them. Without teacher intervention, is, that's because it's by design the LAS were made like that. And during the week, while the students are doing uh, the LAS, in the DLP, we actually allow them to communicate with each other. They, 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 it's a peer tutoring is very, very strong in the dynamic learning program. And it teaches them collaboration and communication to achieve well-defined goals because collaboration and communication is also a skill which we need to develop uh, with the younger students. Now, a, lot, a, a typical question that we receive is that during a pandemic, what is the guarantee that each student is learning? Well, the guarantee in the CVF DLP is that each LAS is copied by hand and answered in the student's own handwriting, which involves the psychomotor, visual, and when read aloud, the hearing faculties of the brain. So uh, unlike if you have, uh, even if you're doing Zoom or MS Teams or Go Google Meet, you, you may be able to see the student on the screen, but you're not really sure whether the student is listening to you. But here, with the copying by hand, you're at least assured there's a guarantee that they're learning. Another question is that 
um, as distance learning, how are learning outcomes assessed aside from tests? Learning is assessed by the daily, uh, by the weekly uh, LAS that is collected and, and evaluated by the teachers. It's not like the usual uh, mode wherein if you just give a midterm or final exams and if the student fails, then it's too late because by that time, the student has already wasted a month or two. But there are here a weekly activities uh, are assessed. And it could be also, the portfolios can also be graded in terms of completeness, neatness, and so on. So just to, just to contrast between a pandemic scenario and the conventional method, in the CVIF-DLP, that's the figure on the left. So the LAS is distributed, whether online or uh, printed and drop with drop-off points. And then the students will be working on them without teacher intervention and uh, no introductory lecture is required for each LAS. And then they will be collected in the same way that they were distributed and they will be assessed weekly. And like in the conventional method, um, they have these modules and they do a lot of teacher training to train the teachers how to do the distance learning. And if these modules are the type of modules that requires teacher lectures, then we are afraid that uh, this might not give a, a good result. We note that for decades, modules and books have already been given to the students and plus the lectures, the, the, the response or the uh, outcome was not really that good, especially in the Philippines. So the, um, maybe uh, to summarize briefly, the CVF dynamic learning, it addresses learner disposition because it's habit forming. They do the daily protocol at home. And it could also address the lack of qualified STEM teachers because as long as you have these learning activity sheets and uh, because it's independent of the teachers, then you can actually bypass, especially in the STEM subjects, this lack of qualified teachers. So the CVIF DLP bypasses, bypasses severely limited face-to-face -face learning modes, especially in a pandemic scenario. It could bypass the lack of internet connectivity. It could bypass the worldwide lack of qualified STEM teachers. And it could, it's actually very cheap that any nation on earth could implement it without much budget. So the high performance outcomes for Filipino youth can be achieved even during this pandemic with no additional foreign loans or extra budget that we can actually use in to, for health services uh, instead. For, uh, for more details, you can look at this uh, website. So let's go back to our questions, which we started at the beginning. Um, yeah, can students learn well when there is a shelter in place advisory to slow down the spread of infection, especially during times of a pandemic? And we say yes. And of course, in many advanced countries, they would say, of course, we have online learning. But what about situations where online learning is not possible? There are even places where there is no electricity in the homes of some students, some of our students in our school, for example. So the next question is, can superior learning outcomes still be achieved <clears throat> even with no internet connectivity? And our answer again is yes. It can be done with our dynamic learning program. It has been tested during calamities such as earthquakes, floods in Cagayan de Oro, uh, Yolanda in, in Tacloban, and all these calamities. Next is, is it necessary for parents to guide their children in their lessons? How about advanced topics? And our answer is no. This is a serious concern of parents. There are many parents who would hesitate very much to tutor their children in their algebra lessons, chemistry, physics, and other more challenging subjects. So we say, parents, you may relax. You don't need to tutor or mentor your children. Can we bypass the worldwide lack of qualified STEM teachers in basic education, which is a question pre-pandemic, during a pandemic, and after the pandemic? It's still a serious issue, and our answer is yes. Uh, we have a program where we can bypass the lack of qualified STEM teachers. Are we taking advantage of new results from neuroscience to improve education? Yes, there are many results of research nowadays. 
Uh, we just don't have time to go into the details of that. And is there a low-cost educational program that allows poorer nations to compete with budget-intensive educational systems of richer nations? And we say yes. Poverty is not an excuse for mediocre academic performance. We believe strongly, and it can be done, we believe that even those with a shoestring budget can still achieve very high performance outcomes for their learners. So after having answered those questions, um, I'd like to thank some people who created the Learning Activity Sheets, or LAS, uh, especially at the senior high school level, uh, through the help of the Science Corps. Uh, let me start with uh, Dr. Benjamin Rubin. He got his PhD from the University of California, San Diego, but currently a postdoc at Berkeley. And uh, another one, another fellow is Dr. Hyunjin Shim. Uh, she got her PhD from um, Ecole Polytechnique de Luzon in Switzerland, but currently now a postdoc at Berkeley. And of course, Dr. Victor Soho, he was the one who created the website ediversum.org. Um, he got his PhD from University College London and then postdoc at the LMU in Munich. And lastly, uh, the most recent fellow uh, was Dr. Hyun Dog Shin, who graduated from MIT. And they all created the LAS, which are actually available for free anywhere in the world. So just go to the to the website. And it's to add, still, yeah. it's still a new website. It's, it's still, still under construction, but there are already a lot of LAS uh, uploaded in the website. In and, chemistry, uh, biology, uh, programming. Yes. And, and if you want to know how to create an LAS, just go to this website. Let us end. We'd like to end with uh, a, a thank you note, uh, especially to Professor Baldomero Oliveira of uh, University of Utah for connecting us with the Science Corps uh, and, and their fellows who are doing and making the creating the LAS. And most especially, we'd like to thank uh, Professor Baldomero for his outreach program to our school, especially in the marine biodiversity uh, aspect. Uh, he comes to Bohol often, Cebu and Bohol, and um, we see each other there. So hopefully after the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you to all. Thank you both very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Chris and Maravik uh, Bernidos, for this, this very insightful uh, presentation. Um, I really commend the two of you for, you know, not only focusing, but also uh, for bringing attention uh, to the critical importance of learning uh, methodologies and pedagogies uh, to be able to maximize and optimize uh, learning outcomes, yes. uh, particularly for uh, young people uh, in developing economies. But in reality, <clears throat> what you're designing is applicable not only to emerging economies, but even to developed economies, uh, particularly here in the United States as well. Well, there's a big challenge uh, in uh, public primary and secondary, secondary schools as well. Uh, so I'm, I'm really intrigued uh, and inspired by uh, your dynamic uh, learning uh, program um, approach. Uh, this really is an example of uh, disruptive innovation applied to education. So, um, and I'm very intrigued by your learning activity uh, sheets, uh, which at times do not involve any intervention by instructors or teachers, uh, which makes it really adaptable to, uh, particularly in this time of pandemic, uh, where people are quarantined and staying at home. But my one quick question for you is, uh, and you talked about this in terms of assessing regularly, perhaps on a weekly basis, uh, the learning uh, activity sheets that the students produce. Uh, in terms of critical thinking, assessing the critical thinking of the students, uh, what sort of uh, metrics or variables do you consider in, in doing that assessment uh, for the learning sheets? Yeah, for, for, well, it will depend now on the design of the activity sheet, the questions and exercises at the end uh, after they read the concept digest and right. follow the example, the illustrations. They normally have to answer questions, do exercises, do problem solving. So it would partially depend on the design of that 
And of course, following DepEd, we do have paper and pen tests also. And that would be a tangible measure of uh, how, how far they are able to develop their critical thinking uh, skills. Of course, it's only partial. We don't say 100%, but it is already a good measure. Right. That makes sense. And I, I really think that the name that you uh, provided, Dynamic Learning Program, I think that's quite apropos uh, to describe your pedagogy. And I think it makes it fun for the students because they're learning, uh, you know, dynamically uh, on their own. Um, and, and that is a very big step in, in terms of lifetime uh, learning. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. We appreciate you. Uh, your contribution. So this uh, concludes uh, part one, which by the way, we're making good time. We're on time. Uh, the first two hours of this plenary session. I'd like to thank again, every one of our distinguished uh, lecturers uh, for this uh, plenary session. So now we're going to move on to the second part of our uh, plenary, uh, which is the awarding ceremony for some exceptional individuals. And I'd like to, to uh, bring on board our president, uh, Dr. Giselle Concepcion, uh, to please join me um, in um, conferring uh, the various awards that we have. So Mon, I'd like to request you please uh, to, uh, <clears throat> okay. Uh, start the sh uh, slides uh, presentation here. So if I may, uh, I, uh, the first uh, awards that we're gonna be presenting today are the uh, Paase Presidential Citation of Excellence. And uh, this are uh, conferred to uh, Dr. Anne Aaron in the field of industry leadership. Uh, we really uh, commend you for uh, your groundbreaking, at least for uh, Filipinos a groundbreaking uh, position and role at a global company like Netflix. And of course, uh, it's being conferred as well to uh, Mayor Richard Gomez uh, in terms of his excellence uh, in public administration. I, I really think that, uh, you know, you're, you're sort of an outlier right now, I think, in, in uh, local governance in the Philippines. But my vision is uh, that you will become a normal uh, in future so that uh, every uh, local government unit officially in the Philippines will have the same educational background and abilities uh, that you have. Um, Mon, uh, well, I've already shown you essentially those three points each that I uh, picked uh, to mm -hmm. highlight the accomplishments of both Dr. Aaron and Mayor Gomez. Uh, and so we really can go now to the uh, formal conferment. So I'll turn over the floor to uh, President Concepcion. Thank you, Joel, and uh, greetings to all, to all our speakers and our uh, attendees, and especially to our awardees. So Anne, um, I'd like to congratulate you again. Everyone should know that Anne is a model of Filipina so she was a valedictorian of her Ateneo class. And I was just talking to Father Nebras about it. And um, they know each other very well and they've kept in touch. And uh, Father Nebras has been visiting Anne for all these years that she's been studying and excelling uh, in her field of expertise in, uh, in Silicon Valley. So Anne, thank you for bringing Netflix to us. We're on the receiving end. We enjoy watching Netflix uh, teleserias and uh, other shows. And uh, many of them are very uh, intellectually, uh, uh, scientifically uh, stimulating as well. So um, welcome to the Fold in Pase. And uh, we would like to thank you for this very uh, exciting talk that you gave us. And so on behalf of Pase, <coughs> I'm honored to uh, present to you the Paase Presidential Citation of Excellence in Industry Leadership, given at the 40th Paase Anniversary Online Meeting and Symposium 2020, Manila, Philippines, 28 July 2020, signed Gisela Concepcion, President, and Joel Coelho, uh, Special Plenary Host. So here it is, Anne. I'm handing it over to you. Here, and I hope uh, we can show Anne receiving a Here. certificate. <laughs> I printed it. Thank you. It's jumped through the internet. 
Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing what accomplishment you're a yeah. model for Filipino women. I, uh, thank you so much. Um, I feel honored. And um, I'm also, thank you for inviting me. I was very, I was, I was inspired by the other talks at this plenary session. So I am, uh, I feel inspired by being in this group um, here today of um, scientists and engineers. And the only other thing I wanted to say is just really to other Filipinas out there, Filipina girls especially, um, do not let your gender, the color of your skin, your accent, or you know, my case, my height, I'm pretty tiny, dictate what you can do in life. So you know, you can do it. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. We're very proud of you. Well, we're also very proud of um, our star, Goma, Mayor Richard <laughs> Gomez, who's um, movies I have watched in the past. <laughs> uh, Richard, uh, it's amazing how you've um, taken technological tools to integrate uh, your efforts in Ormoc City uh, to cope with COVID. It's uh, admirable. And we're always looking for models on the ground of how a mayor's LGUs can really reach out to the people and get them educated and um, information disseminated on what's the best thing to do as individuals uh, for your own benefit as well as that of your family and your community. So thank you very much, uh, Richard, for sharing with us in great, great detail all the uh, measures that you have undertaken in or mock and um, also showing the uh, successes that you have achieved. So on behalf of PASE, I am honored to present you the Presidential Citation of Excellence in Public Administration. You are a PhD from the UPNC PAD. We're very proud of that. Let's give uh, uh, Mayor Richard Gomez a rousing <laughs> of applause. <laughs> Uh, it's given at the 40th Paase Anniversary Online Meeting and Symposium 2020 Manila, Philippines, 28 July 2020. Signed Gisela Concepcion, President, and Joel Cuella, Special Plenary Host. Richard, here. Here's your certificate. There. There you go. Yeah. Thank you. Instant. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I'm really honored. Uh, thank you so much. It's a, it's a privilege to to present all of uh, the best practices that we've been doing here in Ormoc City. And I'm really hoping that uh, in the future, other mayors or governors can uh, can use technology as a tool in uh, doing public administration. And uh, again, I'm very uh, thankful to all those people and organizations who have been helping us uh, with the things that we do here in Ormoc City. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you again, Richard, and more power to you. Good Thank luck you. with all your initiatives and your measures. Hey, Joel, yes. would you like to proceed then? Yes, so again, congratulations to Anne as well as Richard. Uh, so now we're going to move on to uh, the second uh, awards, that uh, batch of awards that we will be uh, conferring. And this is the uh, Paase Honorary Membership Awards. And uh, uh, we have four honorees uh, today, this year. Uh, Mon, if you, we could uh, go to the first one, please, uh, Dr. Emil Javier. Again, uh, you know, the uh, curriculum vita for each one of these honorees is so voluminous that uh, it'll take a long, long time for me to be able to highlight all of their uh, salient accomplishments. So I told myself I'm just gonna pick about four or five items really to highlight them. This is just the tip of the iceberg, of course. Uh, so Dr. Javier is also a national scientist of the Philippines. Uh, he, he was the 17th president of the University of the Philippine System from 93 to 99. Uh, he was also the president of the National Academy of Science and Technology of the Philippines from 06 to 2012. He was secretary of the Department of Science and Technology from 81 to 86. Uh, and he was chair of the Technical Advisory Committee uh, Interim Science Council of CGIAR as the consultative group on international agricultural research 
of the uh, United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, FAO, which is based in Rome, Italy, and he served in that capacity from 99 to 2003. And he also earned his PhD in plant breeding at Cornell University. I must add that uh, Dr. Habir was also the chancellor of the University of the Philippines of, at Los Banos, I believe from 1979 to 1985, before he moved on. Uh, and uh, I was a, an undergraduate at UP Los Banos at that time. And I graduated in uh, agricultural engineering in 1984. So he really just waited one more year. He waited for me to graduate uh, before he uh, left UPLB for greener pastures. So thank you so much, uh, Chancellor Javier. <laughs> I'll pass it on to you now, uh, President uh, Concepcion, for the formal conferment. So um, ladies and gentlemen, um, we are at this part of our program where uh, we're honoring very outstanding Filipinos, those who have contributed significantly throughout their lives through uh, science education, research, <laughs> technology, and um, outreach to the Philippine regions. So which is the theme of our conference this year? It's outreach to the Philippine regions, meaning that their initiatives, their efforts have contributed to um, uh, the benefit of Filipinos in different parts of our country. So um, national scientist Emil Javier, as our NAS president, you are very inspiring. I remember all the philosophical, uh, well, discussions that we would have in NAST. And I think that um, your uh, vision as a UP president to uh, reach out to uh, different parts of the country envisioning UP Mindanao, okay, for example, and the UP Open University with limitless boundaries. I think that's a very singular contribution to a, a science and technology, knowledge and education in our country. Also, you um, built so many important institutions like biotech in UP Los Banos and the Institute of Plant Breeding. And for this, we're very grateful. So on behalf of the PASE, I'm deeply honored to present the PASE Honorary Membership Award to national scientist Emil Q. Javier at the 40th PASE Anniversary Online Meeting and Symposium 2020, Manila, Philippines, 28th of July, 2020. Signed, Gisela Concepcion, PASA President, and Joel Cuella, special plenary host. And as Javier, I'm giving you the certificate now, handing it over to you. Thank you. Maybe hear a few words from national scientist Emil Javier. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. I am. I don't know how to manipulate my screen, but <laughs> anyway, um, thank you, Giselle and uh, Joel, for this kind introduction. Um, it's very kind of you to invite me to join the PASE as an honorary member, and I humbly and heartily accept. Uh, in so many ways, we are kindred spirits particularly the members of PASE who are residing in uh, North America. We are kindred spirits in the sense that we are trying every, every possible way to help build our nation and help our people. And the fact that uh, the PASE members who are now residing abroad uh, are physically separated from the motherland it doesn't stop you as uh, individuals to do whatever you, you can to help our country. Obviously, in the, in the practice of our profession as scientists and engineers. So I humbly and heartily accept the membership and I wish PASE and its members the best in the coming years. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Javier. Thank you. We're honored that you are part now of PASE.
So Moni, we could, yes. So our next uh, awardee for the PASE honorary membership is uh, Dr. Bienvenido Nebres, uh, who's also a national scientist of the Philippines. <clears throat> Again, uh, what I'm outlining here constitutes just the uh, tip of the iceberg of his uh, voluminous and massive curriculum vita. Uh, he served as president of Ateneo de Manila University from 93 to 2011. Uh, he was president as well of Xavier University in Cagayan de Oro City from 1990 to 1993. He obtained his PhD and master's in mathematics from Stanford and his uh, master of arts majoring in philosophy from Birchman's College as well as his uh, AB majoring in philosophy also from Birchman's College. Um, we're honored to uh, welcome you to Paase uh, National Scientist Nebris. I'll turn it over to you Giselle. Okay. Father Ben Nebris is a major contributor to science uh, education and research for many decades. But before I uh, talk a bit about that, let me tell you that um, he's the longest serving president of any major university in the country. He served as president of the Ateneo for 18 years. And the mark of his uh, contributions remain Today, so he expanded the Ateneo uh, on all levels of education throughout the country. And so I think the Jesuit education has been very important in shaping uh, the minds of people in our country. So uh, Father Ben Nebres has uh, got limitless interests. So he's been helping Ched all these years in its um, program to bring um, higher education to a, to a high level, to a higher level okay, in the uh, state universities and colleges, as well as in the private universities and colleges. And uh, he was one of the first in the group uh, of such scientists, faculty, who were influencing, advising, consult consulting at SHED in the very early days. Now, Father Ben Nebres' uh, interests extend to helping children in different parts of our country. So in our one of our last conversations, when we were serving as uh, uh, PICARI members uh, with Dr. Padalina, he would tell me that in, in the end, bottom line is you've got to help the school children, okay? the ones who need the physical and the mental nutrition. So he's on a school feeding program, uh, helping uh, poor communities in um, distant provinces okay? through the Gawad Kalinga program. And he is one of our plenary speakers on August 7. So Father Nebres, we deeply appreciate your contributions to the country. And so on uh, behalf of the PASE, I would like to present you the PASE Honorary Membership Award at the 40th PASE Anniversary Online Meeting and Symposium 2020, Manila, Philippines, 28 July, 2020. Signed, Gisela Concepcion, PASE President, and Joel Pelio, special plenary host. Thank you very much. Other address. I really appreciate it very much. And I do have the certificate here. Um, I also wanted to greet uh, Anne. Actually, I have not seen her since her graduate school days, but it's uh, been wonderful to have her as a student here and to know her as she has, as she has moved on in her career. Um, I, I would like to thank very much uh, the, the past for this honor. Uh, really, I, I believe that the future of our country depends very much on the quality of knowledge, and uh, especially in the sciences and in technology. And that's why I've dedicated a lot of my life there. Uh, but as Dr. Giselle said, uh, all of us scientists were children once. And I, I'm very concerned about the situation of so many of our children who are very vulnerable, uh, 
who are hungry and malnourished, especially at this time. Uh, if you haven't read it, please read the column of Mahar Mangahas, so last July 25, where it points out that hunger and malnutrition has more than doubled in our country. And <coughs> that we're putting the risk at, at risk to so many children in our country. So thank you, Dr. Nisham, for citing that. I, as I said, yes, of course, we honor uh, our PhDs, but there, there were children once. And um, I think that we have to look to the future. And that's why I really believe that uh, we and the sciences should also really work hard to worry about elementary schools. Uh, uh, right now, we're worrying about the first 1,000 days <laughs> about mothers and babies. Uh, we were all babies once. <laughs> so thank you very much for this uh, uh, for this award. I appreciate it very deeply. It's been a pleasure working. I first met Dr. Quelio way, way back in the 80s. Uh, uh, first class and meeting in the US. And I'd like to thank him. And of course, I work a lot with Dr. Giselle on many of these concerns. So thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Nebres, and uh, we're really happy to welcome you to uh, Paase. Thank you uh, for Thank your exemplary uh, career and, and life as well. <clears throat> so we're moving on to our third uh, awardee of the Paase honorary membership, and, and that is uh, Dr. William Padolina. Again, I cannot do justice to uh, highlight uh, all of his accomplishments uh, so I just uh, chose this uh, four items here, again, constituting uh, the tip of the iceberg of his entire curriculum vitae and accomplishments. Uh, he was president of the National Academy of Science and Technology of the Philippines from uh, 2012 to 2015. Uh, he served as deputy director general for operations at the International Rice Research Institute from 06 to 2010. And he served as a secretary of the Department of Science and Technology from 95 to 99. Uh, he earned his PhD in botany phytochemistry at the University of Texas at Austin. And of course, when I was an undergrad at UP Los Banos, he was also one of the uh, prominent and eminent uh, professors at uh, UP Los Banos. So even though he was not one of my instructors, uh, his better half was uh, Dr. Cristina Padolina. Uh, he was very inspiring to uh, a lot of us at UP Los Banos uh, at that time. So thank you. Uh, Dr. I, I turn it over to you, uh, Giselle. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, Joel. So um, it's my turn to um, honor Willie Padolina, whom I knew as a uh, young graduate from UP Diliman. He recruited me to teach in UP Los Banos. So here's my first employer, and I taught in Los Banos right after graduation. And I think taught courses in organic chemistry and general chemistry with uh, Dr. Padalina and uh, his wife, Ina Padalina. So I can uh, uh, vouch that uh, the Padolinas are excellent chemistry teachers, and I learned a lot from them. So uh, you would say that William Padolina is one of my important mentors in uh, science education. But um, Dr. Padolina has devoted his whole life to uh, this advocacy for science and technology. And then in UP Los Banos, he had the INFAPS Honors Program. Do you remember that, Joel? Yes. Yes. And so um, I think he is very, very instrumental in getting the, uh, the young students the right manpower in UP Los Banos to uh, focus on research on high quality science education and research. And so um, after that, it was not surprising that uh, Dr. Padolina moved on in his uh, administrative career in uh, UP Los Banos. And then eventually he uh, served the Department of Science and Technology. And I think that uh, during that time, those were very difficult times. Uh, Dr. Padolina had initiated many, many reforms at the DOST, but then suddenly because of uh, health reasons, he had to uh, resign from the position. But this, not, did, did, this did not prevent him from continuing his uh, campaign for, for science, uh, education, and research. And so uh, Dr. Padolina eventually became 
the NAS president succeeding Emil Javier, national scientist Emil Javier. And I believe it was during this time that the NAS started to reach out to Philippine regions, okay, in line with our theme today. And um, we started having these regional meetings. We started going to the regions to hold our NAS meetings, okay, and get scientists and science administrators as well as science entrepreneurs in these regions to participate at our NAS meetings. Finally, when we had to find somebody, Jed had to find the person to uh, move forward the Philippine, California, uh, PICARI, okay, Advanced Research Institute, we had no doubt that it was Dr. Padolina who would lead this effort. And so he became a uh, the overall uh, implementer of it. And then he requested Father Ben Ambres to serve as the chair of the uh, project advisory group of which I was a member, okay? So uh, with this, you think that um, his contributions are um, so many already, but then after he left the UST, he uh, served in the Institute of uh, Rice International Rice Research Institute, as uh, Joel already mentioned. And he had particular interest in intellectual property and it's, uh, well, sharing so that countries like the Philippines would be able to benefit from the research at theory. So for all of this and for many other good reasons, I'm very proud to present to Dr. William Padolina, the PASE Honorary Membership Award given at the 40th PASE Anniversary Online Meeting and Symposium 2020, Manila, Philippines, 28 July 2020, signed Gisela Concepcion, PASE President, and Joel Coelho, special plenary host. Dr. Padolina, here's your certificate. Okay. He was on. Dr. Padolina, if you could turn on your video. Yes. There, there he is. is. Okay. Yes. <laughs> there Thank you. you. Thank there you, you Giselle and Joel, for this privilege of being conferred the honorary membership of PASE. I I am very, very happy that PASE continues to link with our science communities to uphold our uh, mission to make sure that our science and technology enterprises are actively reflected in our development agenda. I hope that PASE will continue to be active and maybe expand its membership so that it won't just be confined to North America. <clears throat> There's so many other Filipino scientists in other countries. So we should think about maybe a, a kind of an international group that will be more uh, inclusive of the science communities in other countries. But nevertheless, I congratulate PASE for very uh, persistent effort to connect with our local science community. They have been conducting this uh, symposium every year. And even without these meetings, they continue to link with our science community. So congratulations to you all. And thank you for this uh, privilege of, of being an honorary member of your academy. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Padolina. We applaud you and we, we're have, we're, we welcome you to uh, Paase. And, and thank you for that uh, comment or recommendation that you made. Uh, and, and in reality, Paase is heading in that direction in that we now have members from Australia, uh, from Europe and other parts of the world. Yes. So thank you so much yes. and welcome. Uh, Mon, if we could move on, please, to uh, our next uh, 
uh, awardee for the Paase Honorary Membership. Uh, it is uh, being conferred to Dr. Alfredo Pasquale. And again, this uh, three points that I'm highlighting here are just the, the tip of the iceberg of his massive accomplishments. Uh, he served as the 20th president of the University of the Philippines system uh, from 2011 to 2017. Uh, he served at the Asian Institute of Management uh, from 1980 to 1989 in varying uh, capacities. One is uh, the American Express Foundation Professor of Financial Management, uh, the other as Director of Advanced Bank Management Program and Chair of their Masters of Business Administration One program. And he earned his Bachelor's of Science in Chemistry uh, from the Unif University of the Philippines. And I have to know that Dr. Uh, Pascual has earned uh, numerous honoris causa or honorary doctorates from a number of institutions. So uh, we are very pleased and, and privileged and honored to welcome you, Dr. Pascual. I turn it over to you, Giselle. Thank you, Joel. So now I would like to um, uh, say something about uh, Dr. Alfredo Pascual, whom I served uh, as president. I served as a vice president for academic affairs, and I agreed to do so because of his vision for UP. And in his vision, he wanted to make UP a great university and a research intensive university. And uh, I believe that with his uh, vision and uh, the combined efforts of a team that he put together, uh, we were on our way to making UP a great university as shown by the uh, leapfrogging in the rankings of UP uh, among the world and Asian universities today. So uh, Dr. Pasquale uh, is a chemistry graduate and uh, many uh, people do not know that he taught chemistry even before he graduated because he was a very outstanding student. And uh, one of his professors who uh, appreciated him a lot asked him to teach lab, okay? Chemistry lab, even before he graduated. But then he was also a, an active student leader and there was a foretelling that at some point perhaps chemistry was not really a sufficient discipline for him. He needed to um, move out to the world and uh, learn how the world works in other ways okay, that would be more perhaps inclusive of society. So he uh, pursued an MBA and uh, then went on uh, to a career, a very outstanding career in uh, business, in finance. And eventually he ended up again uh, doing uh, what he loved best which is teaching. So he actually taught also in management engineering, in engineering program of the Ateneo. And eventually he taught uh, finance as an outstanding professorial chair, American Express a professorial chair at the Asian Institute of Management. Okay, and afterwards, still not satisfied with that. I think um, he decided that he needed uh, to be involved in action on the ground. So he joined the Asian Development Bank where he is responsible for uh, many private public partnership uh, deals or arrangements in the Philippines and also in other countries. Now that is a backdrop for uh, the backdrop and the background for the person who became the 20th president of the University of the Philippines, bringing with him uh, to uh, the position, his um, great love for academics, both science and art, as well as his experience in uh, the uh, private business world. And that allowed him to manage uh, many, many uh, uh, endeavors in UP that needed attention at that time, synchronously, okay? You might say combinatorially, efficiently. And so um, I'd like to say that it was a pleasure serving under uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Fred Pascual. And uh, I think that his contributions could be um, summarized uh, with two, two principles that he upheld. 
that is one UP. We are one UP. So you might say that we uh, leveled up the other constituent units okay, in the distant provinces, say to the level of the leading units, Diliman, Manila, and Los Baños, so that we could all be one UP. UP is one. The other one is that we champion knowledge, knowledge-based Philippine society. And this was um, encapsulated in a UP knowledge paper that was authored by Dr. Pasqual and our team in 2016, which we presented to uh, the presidential, national presidential candidates at that time. So um, on behalf of the PASE, I am deeply honored to um, present this PASE Honorary Membership Award to Dr. Alfredo Pasqual at the 40th PASE Anniversary Online Meeting and Symposium 2020, Manila, Philippines, 28 July 2020. Gisela Concepcion, signed Gisela Concepcion, President of the PASE, and Joel Cuello, Special Plenary Host. Here's the certificate that I'm handing over to you. Thank you. Got here soon enough. Thank you, Giselle. I think uh, this award is the closest I could get to my high school dream of being a scientist. That's why I took up chemistry because that was my young mind uh, dream in high school. Uh, but as fate had it, I drifted away uh, to, I would not say more exciting, but uh, different fields. And, uh, but eventually got back uh, to the university and uh, had been able to contribute to the development of uh, UP to be, become a uh, much more intensive uh, research university. And I applaud the uh, PASE, of which I can now count myself as a, a part of, uh, the closest of being a scientist to be asso associated with the distinguished and accomplished scientists and engineers in the ranks of pa PASE. And I, I applaud PASE for having served its mission and making it a reality uh, to have this uh, collaboration and interaction between Philippine descent scientists and engineers abroad uh, and uh, the uh, Filipino scientists that are uh, uh, based still in the Philippines. Uh, that, and uh, I think the pandemic has even made that uh, at least sharing of uh, knowledge more intensified, uh, given that I understand that this year with the use of uh, the uh, online platform, we were able to bring in many more uh, speakers to share uh, their uh, ideas. Um, I wish PASE would uh, further work on uh, dissemination of technology. Uh, beyond just uh, research and development, and actually move towards uh, commercialization you know, of technology. Uh, I've heard some technologies both in, just now, you know, uh, technology in uh, learning and technology in uh, vertical agriculture that is really very much applicable you know, to the different parts of the country. And, and I hope, uh, we could exert efforts in disseminating this to other places in the country. Thank you very much. It's a, I accept the award of membership and I, I hope to be able to work, you know, to some extent with uh, the PASE. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Dr. Pasqual, and we're honored to have you part of the Academy and we look forward to uh, collaborating and working with you going forward. So now we come to the uh, finale of our plenary session and awarding uh, uh, portion. And this is the conferment of the uh, Paase Lifetime Achievement Award uh, to uh, no less than Dr. Luis uh, Villafuerte. 
Uh, Mon, if you could just please uh, display uh, this uh, five points that I called from his massive uh, accomplishments, uh, which again, do not really do justice, complete justice to uh, what he has accomplished, but just to give you uh, an appetizer. <laughs> Um, and uh, Dr. Uh, Villafuerte uh, was a Philippine congressman uh, for three terms um, from the third district of Camarina Sur. Uh, he served as governor of the province of Camarina Sur as well. Uh, he was president of the League of Provinces of the Philippines. He served as minister of trade of the Republic of the Philippines. And he received numerous honorary doctorate degrees from various institutions. Um, and he's had so much more accomplishments than what is uh, shown here. I turn it over to you, uh, Giselle. Thank you, Joel. So now I'd like to speak about um, a man who's probably um, been uh, the most important advocate of PAS here in the Philippines. And uh, his, um, the way I, relate to him is this is like it's almost paternal okay? the advice the guidance is given us in PASE is immeasurable I'm referring to um, congressman Luis Villafuerte now many of you will recall that in 2006 PASE went on a massive campaign to um, get government to invest in more funds in science and technology. And it originated with a uh, position paper that we co-authored with former Secretary Ernie Pernia, Cesar Salama, Rodora Astanza, Toby Dairit, and Alvin Kulab. So it's multi-institutional. Uh, authorship, but it was a Paasa paper. And together with that position paper, Cesar Salama wrote a proposal to build a national science complex. Toby Dairi wrote the proposal uh, to invest more funds in master's and PhD scholarships. And I gathered together 50 R&D capsule proposals from our members and other scientists uh, in UP and other universities. And we compiled all of these documents and together with the hundreds of science articles that had been published in Star Science over so many years, it contributed by PAASA members. We printed all of this, produced 60 sets of them, and we sent them to uh, President Gloria Macapagal at that time, the vice president, uh, members of the cabinet, the Senate, and Congress, including Luis Villafuerte. The day after he received the documents, he called me. I think the rest is history. He called me and he talked about all of his priorities relating to science education and science and technology development in our country. And where was he coming from? Luis Villafuerte is a naturalist. He's a gentleman farmer. So he uh, lives by what he thinks and says. So in his province, he has developed the uh, many projects relating to agriculture, livestock, and even marine uh, resources. And it's so infectious in his family that his two children are also into science-based development of our natural resources. So what happened then was um, we started meeting regularly, okay? The group of six with him and many more scientists in the past, eh? including Secretary Estrella Alabastro, and including our past vanguard under Secretary Boy de la Peña, now our DOSC secretary. Okay? And finally, uh, Luis Villafuerte said, we should go 
to uh, Malacanang and get the president to support us on all these initiatives. And so on, in August 20, 2006, we were in Malacanang and he got the first huge amount of money allocated by uh, the president. Okay. Well, after everything was so said and done, we had 1.7 billion for the National Science Complex. And for that, an executive order okay, was made to justify this major investment. And also 400 million pesos was lodged in the DOST for our various R&D proposals. Okay, of course, under a uh, you know, proper review and evaluation, and also another 200 million pesos for master's and PhD scholarships. So I think there's a major contribution that we owe Congressman Louis Villafuerte this, this honor from the PASE as a Lifetime Achievement Award. And this is the first award that we've ever given at PASE. So, Congressman Villafuerte, I am deeply honored and very happy to um, confer on you this award of PASE, the PASE Lifetime Achievement Award given at the 40th PASE anniversary online meeting and symposium 2020, Manila, Philippines, 28 July, 2020, Signed Gisela Concepcion, PASA President, and Joel Coelho, Special Plenary Host. Dr. Villafuerte, here is your certificate. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Giselle. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes we can hear you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Permit me to express... Uh, my uh, profound gratitude and appreciation to Paasi for conferring upon my humble self a Lifetime Achievement Award which provides me great honor to accept. My interest in science and technology actually started when I as chairman of the Presidential Commission on Government Reorganization during the incumbency of then President Cory Aquino, I proposed and it was approved to elevate the then National Science Development Board into an executive level department, now the Department of Science and Technology. Uh, since then, I have really become very interested in any and all aspects of development of science and technology in our country. Such that when I became a congressman, I, I ensured that I be the one to present to Congress the annual budget of the Department of Science and Technology. It was when Dr. Giselle uh, Concepcion approached me about uh, the need to provide uh, more funds for science and technology that after I obtained the approval in principle uh, of then President Dore Macapagal Arroyo of the big amount of 1.7 billion initially for the National Science Complex at the University of the Philippines, uh, she told me that she approved it, but I should have the responsibility to find the money. And that afternoon, when the session of Congress began, I introduced verbally uh, through a motion to cut down a multi-year budget of another agency of government which they will not need in one year but will spend for several years to cut it down 
by 1.7 billion and that motion was approved and that is how the story went uh, thank you sir amid the corona virus pandemic it is my special privilege to be associated with paasi a very prestigious association of scientists and engineers which i consider to be the cream de la cream in your respective fields of discipline if i may contribute an advocacy to your discussions at your various meetings may i urge you <coughs> the distinguished members of paasi to provide preventive and curative measures to avert infection of the coronavirus that transforms itself to covid-19 such measures should be plant based and not synthetic or pharmaceutical grade with side effects i am basically a lawyer but have been a voracious reader and researcher of many scientific studies and have become an avid advocate of natural remedies from plant based rather than the synthetic or pharmaceutical based remedies i will be turning 85 years old on august 29 this year and at my age i must tell you that i am not taking any pharmaceutical drugs but instead i am taking many nutraceuticals and botanicals consisting of the following among others i take your cumin spirulina liposomal vitamin c vitamin b complex vitamin d3 k2 zinc with selenium nitric acid from beet plant black garlic omega rejuvenol natto kinase i also take moringa tea with virgin coconut oil three times a day plus i also drink coconut water and eat the coconut meat daily i also apply magnesium oil throughout my body twice a day my magnesium oil is not the pharmaceutical synthetic grade i use magnesium chloride derived from sea water and not the magnesium sulfate since the onset of the corona virus i also started to gargle warm water mixed with sea salt i believe in organic agriculture and i have established an organic farm in my province of tabarini sur where i also produce organic fruits and vegetables organic egg and free range chicken i'm not opposed to a vaccine per se but the race to develop a vaccine by pharmaceutical companies are led by pfizer merck sanofi and glaxo with a back with a track record of having paid 35 billion us dollars for the past 10 years worth of damages to those who suffered injuries debilitating conditions and even death from vaccines that they produce this is considering 
that the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services admitted that fewer than 1% of people who were injured went to court. In the current development of the vaccines by these U.S. and European pharmaceutical companies, they adopted an exclusionary criteria wherein those with the following medical conditions were not, were not allowed to be subjected to the clinical trials. This included, those, this included were, those included were only very healthy people and did not include those with diabetes, hypertension, obesity, asthma, rheumatoid, arthritis, autoimmune disease, respiratory problems, those with history of seizures, those who smoke a cigarette and vape e-cigarettes, and also exclude pregnant women and children from the clinical trials. And yet, the vaccine that is proposed to be applied mandatorily to all irrespective of age and pre-existing medical conditions. And since at least six strains of coronavirus have been identified, it is not clear whether the vaccines being developed applies to all the strains that have emerged. And since the virus which does not cover new and additional strains, the vaccine will become useless in my view. Also, the duration of the effectivity of a vaccine is not guaranteed for, the, for life. How many injections of the vaccines will be applied to every person is not also clear. There are also other ingredients in the vaccine as they have done with other vaccines which are being applied for preservatives and other purposes such as mercury, aluminum, formaldehyde, MSG, and others which have been harmful, uh, which have harmful effects. I am also skeptical about the vaccines being developed in China because the origin of the coronavirus was in Wuhan city in China. And there is a growing consensus by scientists that the Nobel coronavirus, which is otherwise known as SARS-CoV-2 virus, was man-made and was manipulated to spread in order that a vaccine could be developed that would be very profitable to the producers. I'm therefore urging that we in the Philippines, through the initiative of PAASI, develop an alternative plant-based all-natural preventive and curative treatment to the coronavirus. As I have said, there are many nutraceuticals and botanicals that can be used, studied, and researched and applied. I recall that early on, the Secretary of the Department of Science and Technology suggested that we in the Philippines develop our own vaccine. But somehow, when the World Health Organization called for the so-called solidarity trials 
of participating countries, the Philippine government seemed to have shifted gear to just having access to vaccines made by other countries. In the State of the Nation address of President Duterte yesterday, he recommended that a new institution to be called Disease Prevention Authority should be established by law to ensure that should there be future pandemic, a government body could attend to it. This is an opportunity for Paasi to recommend what measures should be adopted to strengthen the natural immune system of Filipinos as coronavirus is to coronavirus. The ultimate defense, in my opinion, against not only the COVID-19, but other diseases is the strengthening of our natural immune system. Having a healthy lifestyle in terms of proper nutrition, hygiene, and sanitation are complementary approaches to resisting any endemic or pandemic. We in the Philippines have many plant-based natural resources that could <coughs> be developed and tapped by Paasi in order that we can develop our own preventive and curative modalities for any infectious diseases and other ailments. Apart from considering approaches by Paasi to the current coronavirus pandemic, I have several other suggestions and recommendations to Paasi. I propose that in your current discussions, uh, you identify 10 projects uh, in agriculture, in health, in education, in information and communications technology, and other fields of science and technology. Compile the suggestions and I will assist in navigating the budget through Congress so that Paase can devote its time, effort, skills, and experience to the accomplishment of such projects. I, for example, propose that in the field of uh, agriculture, there should be a program, as suggested by the earlier speaker, to promote hydroponics, aquaponics, together with indoor agriculture, particularly in the highly urbanized areas. Such a program, if developed in this country through Paasi, could very well uh, ensure uh, the adequacy of food security uh, in our country. In education, there was a suggestion uh, that to ensure the improvement of the STEM uh, system in our curriculum, uh, I would propose also that a curriculum review that will introduce the instructional uh, materials for the development of a STEM system should be developed, improved, expanded, and applied throughout our educational system. Uh, but I would add to the STEM to make it STEAM, so that it stands not only for science, technology, 
engineering, but we add an A, art, and then mathematics. Uh, uh, that is my view. Uh, in uh, information and communications technology, the proposal to have a blended learning system, virtual learning, yeah, uh, online education, I think uh, there is a need, as I have earlier proposed, that the minimum knowledge requirement for every grade and year level from kinder to high school should be clearly defined. While more than the minimum can be taught, but the passing grade is to learn the minimum 100%. Uh, that system has been adopted in other countries and that has improved considerably the educational system of these other countries. I can go on and on and make suggestions and will be prepared to sit down uh, with Paasi and its uh, speakers on how we can develop to Paasi at least 10 programs and projects that we can uh, uh, seek funding so that uh, science and technology development will go on in this country. Once again, I uh, thank you for conferring me this award and I accept it humbly and with pride. Thank you very thank much you. indeed, uh, Dr. Villafuerte, Congressman Villafuerte. We applaud you uh, for your uh, inspiring work and life. So thank you very much indeed. Um, and regarding the, uh, the comments that you uh, provided to us, of course, we're taking them uh, with appreciation and due consideration. And as for that very specific recommendation uh, that you uh, gave to us of Paase, uh, selecting 10 uh, grand challenge areas, and that uh, you would be uh, willing to uh, coordinate with us to help us find the funding, we certainly accept that, sir. <laughs> Thank you so very much. Uh, and many congratulations to you again. And many congratulations to all the awardees. Thank you. Uh, so on behalf of our ASA president, oh, would you like to say something else? No, yeah. no, I have said enough. All right. <laughs> so again, thank you so very much. We will be coordinating with you for sure. Uh, so on behalf of our ASA president, Concepcion, uh, we'd like to thank again all of our uh, superlative speakers and honorees, uh, Dr. Anne Aaron, uh, Mayor Richard Gomez, uh, Dr. Chris and uh, Marvick uh, Bernidos, uh, as well as, of course, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Padolina, Dr. Pasqual, uh, Dr. Nebris, Dr. Javier, and of course, Congressman Dr. Villafuerte. Thank you so very much to everyone. And with this, uh, we adjourn this uh, special plenary session. We thank everyone for joining us. Uh, good morning in the Philippines and good night here in North America. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in um, all the other sundry uh, sessions uh, that we will be having uh, in the next two or three weeks uh, here at Paase. Happy 40th anniversary to everyone on behalf of Paase. Thank you so very much. Uh, sir, good can night. we get the screenshot? Uh, can we ask everyone sure. to please turn on their webcams, please? All right, we'll have a uh, class picture. <laughs> okay. So please uh, turn on your cameras. Turn on your uh, cameras. And we're going to have a group picture. All right. Um, thank you so much. Okay. Uh, on my mark, uh, we have two screens, but because we're like a lot of people, so please bear with me. Uh, on my mark, po. one, two, three. That's for the first screen. Hold on for the second screen. Second screen. You ready? Okay. One, two, three. Thank you so much. Thank you. Right. And a special thanks to uh, Mon uh, Pancho. I mean,
we won't be able to, uh, we would not have been able to manage this. So thank you so very much indeed. Yeah, thanks to all and good night. Thank you.